Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, the sanctimoniously notorious R&B, who forgot, ladies and gentlemen, I forgot to do something. Hang on. Technical difficulties. I forgot to turn the light. So, you know, I've been having technical difficulties since yesterday and today, but that was that was something I could I could fix. Welcome to this monumentous show. My God, monumental, monumentous. 200 episodes, 200 episodes of Rob Observations, the show about something. I can't believe it's been 200 episodes. And uh, first of all, I have to thank all of you, all of you imagination connoisseurs out there that make up this, the Post Geek Singularity community. I don't think I would still be here if nobody was paying attention. And while our audience remains small, it's a very robust, very thoughtful, very engaged audience, and I love all of you for that. Um, as far as YouTube analytics go and all those things, I mean, to have the kind of engagement that I get from all of you is amazing. And so let me just say a very heartfelt thanks to all of you who support the channel, support me, support the website at thebrunettework.net, which the, the website really didn't exist when we started the channel. And uh, as a result of this channel, it's grown exponentially. And part of the great thing about all of this is the letters that you guys and girls and gentle beings and people of all shapes, sizes, colors, cre creeds, persuasions, belief systems, genders. It's been great. Uh, it's been great connecting with all of you. And I, I look forward to doing so for hundreds of more episodes. But, you know, give yourselves all a great big hand, a great big uh, congratulatory slap on the back if you can. If not, have somebody else do it for you, because as we all know, hitting yourselves on the back can be difficult, unless you're Bill Shatner. Anyway, again, I figured, you know, I was trying to figure out, like, what am I going to do to make this episode special? And, I, you know, I was going to try and do, well, Gilbert and Tallulah can be barking, I guess. That could be special. But I figured, you know what? What makes this channel special? What makes this show special? What makes... Observation special is you guys. So this is going to be Gilbert. Maybe maybe Gilbert's gonna gonna have something to say about that. But Gilbert, oh Gilbert, oh I, I suppose I, it can't be a show. It can't be a show, can it? It can't be a show without my my co-hosts. I, I started out with one. I have two. Both Gilbert and Tallulah are here. Uh, they want cookies. Which is come on, you know you got to get up. Everyone likes to watch you get up. That's right. Now, so Lula gets her cookie. She's not like Chewbacca that doesn't get a, an award. You can, it won't be a show. It's almost like I planned this. Amazing. But I can't. Uh, here you go, Tallulah. Gilbert, you get one more, buddy. One more, dude. Okay, no, no. You got to chew it into the mic, buddy. You know how much I like that. Yes. So great. ASMR. That's, that's the best. Just that's you. And Tallulah gets hers. Okay, bud. Now get down. Get down. You made your appearance, buddy. Oh, yeah. So you get down. No, no, no. You got to get down now. You you, you only get that many. Down. Down, but I know. I know. Good boy. And good girl, Tallulah. So there you guys go. There is Gilbert and Tallulah, ladies and gentlemen, my co-hosts for the show. I mean, they've had more fun than I have, I think. They've certainly got more cookies. By the way, I'm wearing a Her Universe shirt. That's right. I'm wearing a Her Universe shirt. They are not a sponsor of this show, but when Her Universe, which is a geek fashion line for women, which was new at the time, this was one of their first shirts. I guess it's a black light Gorn shirt. I've never seen it under black light. I just like it, and it was clean, and I figured I could rock a girl's T-shirt today because why not? I've got man boobs. Uh, I just thought it'd be fun to wear and support her universe because I always like what they do. But they don't sponsor me. As you all know, you know who sponsors me besides all of you guys? Lucky Tiger men's grooming products for those men who want to look good and feel great. They, of course, have been sponsoring this channel for a number of months now. I thank them. I thank their president, Alan Murphy, for coming on and letting me do a video with him. And uh, I really appreciate that they support the channel, support me, support Rob Observations and the Burnett work. So thank you very much to Lucky Tiger. Thank you to their president, Alan Murphy, for making that possible. And I want to remind all of you, if you go to their website at getluckytiger.com and you buy anything, when you check out, and if you punch in PGS for this, the Post Geek Singularity community, you, say it with me now, get 20% 
off of your order. And also, they are running a tail gators. There's the Lucky Tiger tail gators giveaway going on. There's football happening, people. The football season is upon us. Whether you're playing pop league, whether you're J high, middle school, high school, college, pro. You need tailgating equipment, and Lucky Tiger is running a sweepstakes through Labor Day. Actually, I said sweepstakes. I meant giveaway. They're running a giveaway, a random giveaway, through Labor Day. So if you go to their two websites, clubluckytiger.com or getluckytiger.com, and you enter, you have the possibility of winning $500 of tailgating materials, things you need to become the expert tailgater you have always wanted to be, including a grill which is pretty cool. Now, I'm going to start this chat off, because it's all about you guys, with some interesting news, some good news, some real, real news. Now, uh, news about one of you, one of you, members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. How often do I get to do that? Hopefully more often than not. Uh, as we know, uh, there's there's a couple of couple of professional things going on with people. Willow Yang has, of course, written a very uh, a great paper for a prestigious journal. She's still waiting to hear back whether it's going to be published. There's a when you're when you're when you're a scientist, you can't just publish anything willy nilly. There's it has to be checked. It has to be peer reviewed. So we don't know the disposition of her paper yet. I'm sure it's going to be fine. But what's very cool is young master Bobby Kessler who wrote to me a few weeks ago about the fact that he's been doing some intern internships. He's been studying cinema. He has dreams of working in the film business. He wrote to me, and that means he wrote to all of you, asking his advice. He'd been talking to a director about getting on this film, to intern on this film, and he talked. He'd gone back and forth with the director, and then the day he was supposed to start, or the day that he thought he was supposed to start, which was a Friday, he didn't hear from the director. He was fearful. The director was ghosting him, and on this show, I said, young master Kessler, the director's pretty busy, especially if they're going to shoot. Nobody starts shooting on a Friday, usually. Sometimes they do, but usually they don't. And I made the, the uh, it, I, I told him, and I told all of you guys, that the people you need to be dealing with, if you have a potential job on any kind of a, a media project, whether it's a film, whether it's television, whether it's a commercial, a music video, whatever, the people that you need to be interfacing with is not the director. It's production, the production office. You want to talk to the production manager, the assistant production manager. Well, lo and behold, that Sunday night after the Friday that Bobby thought he was supposed to start, he was, in fact, called by production, and he started a week ago. Young Bobby Kessler started on his first movie a week ago, and I asked him if he would write in and report to the Post Geek Singularity community and tell me uh, what exactly had been going on for him during the uh, first week of his movie. And he did that. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what Mr. Bobby Kessler has to say about his first week working on a motion picture. Here it comes. It's a great story, by the way. So this is Bobby Kessler. Driving to our set location on the first day was terrifying. I recall my heart pounding faster and faster as my GPS got close to the destination. Once I arrived, I met the other production assistants on the job who were extremely welcoming. The production manager of the film was also pretty welcoming and appreciative of me taking this job since I'm not being paid for the internship, unfortunately. Basically, I've been doing the work that nobody else on set wants to do. From that very narrow summary, this may look like the job from hell, especially for no pay. However, can I remind you that I am part of a feature film production? How cool is that? A lot of my job is setting up locations, organizing crew meals, running around to get people to different locations, etc. But I am doing all of this while a film is being crafted. People like me who love creating art, <clears throat> uh, who love creating art, are assisting others who also love creating art, and I find that very cool. I've been studying cinema for two years now, but nothing I've studied has given me this kind of experience. Being up close and personal with a film set like this has been completely eye-opening and extremely interesting. Even when crew members are clashing and not everything is going well, which happens to be the case on this set, unfortunately. Seeing all of these things is completely fascinating for me. 
even, <clears throat> uh, hang on, fascinating for me. I get to see all of the parts of a film come together in what could either be a beautiful or horrible cocktail of ideas. I'll highlight two stories from set so far that I have found particularly memorable to give you a glimpse of this job. This past Thursday, 20 minutes before I was going to leave for set, my production manager texted me saying that I needed to pick up their picture car for set. I'm the kind of person who hates last minute changes to my schedule. Uh, but in this job, this was nothing too out of the ordinary. I drove to the hotel where the cast and crew was staying and to get the car. When I arrived, I saw that the car was covered in rust, must, and dirt. It was clearly from the 70s or 80s, which made sense since I believe the film is a period piece. When I got in the car, I immediately noticed this was going to be a problem when I pushed on the brakes. To keep it brief, these brakes ain't too hot. <laughs> I had to push. <laughs> I had to push with all of my might to get the car to a complete stop. So instantly, I'm horrified. How the hell am I going to get this thing to set without getting in an accident? I plugged the address in my phone and I hit the road at a very slow pace. Once again, our set of the day was located in a back road farm in Iowa. So the GPS would be essential for my journey. I'm driving on the road, scared for my life until I see my turn, which I take. I get confused when this road has a sign that says private property on it, but I also just assume that this was for the farm we were going to. I pull onto a gravel road, which feels like it's taking even more of a toll on the car than typical driving but I keep driving, but then I see, oh, thank you. But then I see that the road has disappeared. I immediately brake as hard as I can to find the road discontinued ahead of me. I was about to drive down a giant hill of cornfields. I turn around and head back to the road, freaking out since I was going to be late to set. I had no idea where I was going. Luckily, when I reached the stop sign, <laughs> I saw the van for the art department. Of course you did, because the art department is great, which I followed to set. I also had to take the car back at 12 a.m. that night, which was just as frightening as before. This was the craziest thing I had to do, but then Friday happened. We were going overtime since our producers had not properly organized their schedules, which is unfortunately typical for this production. At 11 p.m. at night, my production manager comes up to me and says, come with me, Bobby. We're going to go wrangle a cow. <laughs> um, excuse me? I guess our director wanted a scene where the characters would be driving in the road right next to a cow, which seemed extremely hard to pull off. The producer claimed he'd organized it with the local family, so our mission was to greet them and set up the encounter. My production manager and I get to my car and talk about the film and also his previous work. He'd worked on the American guinea pig films, which I had found particularly interesting since I'm a total gorehound. Once we arrive to our destination, we are encountered by the family who walk us out to the fence right next to the highway. They begin throwing hay and some other food onto the side of the fence, screaming out several cow calls. I've always lived in the Midwest, but I've never been too involved in farming practices, so I was a bit weirded out by the cow calls. <laughs> Eventually, see, we see a few black shadows slowly strutting towards us. Uh-oh. Before there's time to think, 20 huge cows start galloping over to us. Admittedly, I took a few steps back in fear. Basically, we stood there a few feet away from watching these giant cows eat, which is not how I expected to spend my Friday night. After 30 minutes, the actors and director arrived to set. When the director talked to the cow owner, he found out that he could not let the cow out of the fence to use it for the scene, so he shrugged his arms and left. So our experience with the cows was completely meaningless. But I have to say, I'll never forget it. These are just some of the many things I've had to do for this internship. Even though 12-hour days are very tiring and not always exciting, the fact that I'm working on a film makes it all worth it for me. The experiences I'm getting out of it I'll make it worth it in the end, and plus, I can add this to my resume. I have one week left of this internship since my classes start next week, so I'm totally bummed out that this is coming to an end. It is really going by fast. Bobby Kessler. Well, Bobby, uh, this is the best kind of letter ever to get, first of all. Not that all the letters I get aren't great, but this, 
you know, I, I can't help but feel a kinship for you because when I first started my first job, I worked as the production art department production assistant on Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I frequently had experiences like you had. You just never knew, especially on a movie like Leatherface, you just never knew what you were going to do from day to day. And savor this, remember it, and it's going to be something you're not going to forget. But like you said in your letter, uh, this kind of thing, this kind of experience is, it doesn't matter how long you're in film school. You know, you can study all the movies you want. You can watch the Apu trilogy. You can watch every movie that Antonioni made. You can talk about Francois Truffaut's The 400 Blows till the cows come home. And you saw them come home. <laughs> but you're never going to be able to learn in a classroom what you've learned in the last week and what you're going to learn in the next week. Uh, I only have one other bit of advice for you. I'm always telling people, you don't want, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. And if you've got a good relationship with the production manager, just ask him, tell him that it would mean a great deal to you that if you got a screen credit at the end of the movie, whether it's production assistant, whether it's intern, whatever it is, get your name in the end credits. That's the least they can do. It costs no money. I've always said to people, it costs no money to put someone else's name in the end credits. Now, I understand on a union production, there are rules. But on what sounds to be a very low-budget production where you've got all hands on deck, you're making an invaluable contribution, and the least they can do is make sure that you get your name in those end credits. And maybe, don't demand this, but if the production manager is amenable to that, ask him if you can get it in writing. That's all I'd say, because I'll tell you, my father, he didn't go see Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, not the whole movie, but he went and paid and he watched the end credits just to see my name scroll by. And the phone call I got from him, he was in Seattle, I was in Los Angeles, and the phone call I got from my dad, even though I, I was getting paid, it was one of the proudest days of my life to know that my dad went and <laughs> went to the theater and he went, <laughs> I mean, all the movies that Phantasm he walked out of, I couldn't believe he went to the theater and saw Leatherface, The Texas Chance on Massacre 3, but he only went in and watched the credits just to see my name. So it's something you'll always have to look at. And by the way, you know what you do? Everybody does now when things come out in 4K, you take a frame grab, you blow up the title card, you blow up the card that you have your, you blow up part of the credits, and you frame it together, put it up on the wall. Um, see if they'll do that for you. And it sounds like they might. It's worth doing a lot of fun. And 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 tell us, I, I, I hope that you write us a letter about your next week and keep in touch because right now, man, you're living the dream. You are living the dream. And whether you're driving a car with no brakes or you're trying to wrangle cows that ultimately you can't wrangle, these are the stories, my friend. These will shape your career and they will shape the rest of your life. And it is amazing. It is amazing that this is happening for you. And uh, I'm sure the entire post-geek singularity, all of the imagination connoisseurs here feel the same way, Mr. Kessler. And uh, kudos to you, sir. Kudos for sticking out. And also showing perseverance, not being too pushy. And, you know, all, all I can say is clearly you're endearing yourself to the people on the set, which is what you want to do. Don't be a kiss-ass. Just keep your eyes open, watch what's happening, and listen. So congratulations. Very excited for you. It's all very exciting. Uh, there's a lot of people already writing in, and I want to thank you all for that. It's crazy. I'm gonna let's just let's jump right into it. Oh, am I surprised? CJ Dunn is here. Hello, Mr. Dunn. How are you? Rob has returned from the upside down. I don't know what happened yesterday. Literally, I was streaming, and my stream from yesterday looks terrible. I don't know if this was something that I was doing. I don't think so. Nothing really changed. I didn't change any settings. I hope it looks good today. But as somebody put on one of the chats. <laughs> like 240, 240 resolution or whatever. Sorry about that. I, I, and again, my computer just froze up. I got locked out of my own stream. So I apologize for that. Noel Ryan says, congratulations on episode 200. Well, thank you very much for that. Muckbang Reviews says, I think you missed my super chat, Ari Edgar Allan Poe's short stories yesterday. I blame YouTube. No worries, but please talk Poe at some point and I'm happy. 
My favorite is the Pit and the Pendulum, so tense. I think Pit and the Pendulum is also one of the greatest adaptations that Roger Corman made of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I was involved with Jeffrey Combs and Stuart Gordon for a while, and Darren Scott, my friend Darren Scott. We were trying to get their Edgar Allan Poe movie, Nevermore, off the ground. We actually had Dennis Paoli turn the one-man uh, theater script into a, a screenplay that's quite good. Still love to do it one day, uh, but we haven't been able to do that. JB Von Bonifacio says, in class right now, but happy 200th connoisseurs. Well, JB, thank you very much. Tiberius Monk 84 says, happy 200th episode. Live long and prosper RMB. Well, thank you, Tiberius Monk. Do it for cash says, just saw Apocalypse Now in IMAX. The horror. The horror. Uh, what'd you think? I hope you loved it. Uh, Willow Yang says, Barbecue Network asks if you can tell them about the status of the To Live and Die in L.A. TV series and what aspects from the movie you'd like to see in it. Uh, I was not aware that there is a To Live and Die in L.A. TV series. I haven't read anything about that, um, but that would be a great idea. I mean, I would, of course, William Peterson in that movie plays Richard Chance, a Secret Service agent who is chasing after Rick Masters, played by Willem Dafoe, who is a counterfeiter. John Pankow is in it. Darlan Flugel is in it. Uh, I love that film so much. Wang Chung does the score. The only uh, the only status, if they do make a series of To Live and Die in L.A., I would keep the theme song. I would keep the theme song. That's what I would do. But I don't know anything else about that. I'm not really sure what's going on. Sujis says, happy 200th episode, Rob. Lots of love from India. And what I can say about that is, Sujis, thank you very much. And we don't, in America, none of us watch enough Bollywood movies. I think our lives would be better if, in fact, we did. Wade O'Neill is here. Wade O'Neill says, I just got out of a play about depression. So currently in a Mexican restaurant with happy music, comfort food, and comfort drink. Can't actually hear what's happening, but congratulations on 200 shows. Well, Wade O'Neill, have a Cadillac margarita for me. Um, here, I'll smile for you. Hey, don't be depressed. Um, I hope the play was good, though. Cosmic Doctor says, congrats, Rob, on your 200th episode. Thank you for sharing your expertise with all of us in the post-geek singularity. Your sincerity and true love of film is much appreciated. Thank you. No, Cosmic Doctor. Thank you for supporting the channel, and thank you for the kind words. Movie, movie, movie. Movie Fenobi says, congratulations on 200, Master Rob. Well done being real. Well, Movie Fenobi, can you imagine if we get a Ewan McGregor headlining Obi-Wan Kenobi series on Disney Plus? I've always said that I would love to have seen an Obi-Wan Kenobi trilogy where he's a masterless samurai. He gets called away from guarding the, the, the twins or guarding young Luke and has to go save the galaxy once again, being that he's one of the only Jedi remaining after the Order 66 purge. I can't wait. Uh, Benjamin23 says, four years ago, ketoacidosis, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism. Almost died twice in a two-month period. People like you and other YouTube movie pundits kept me sane and gave me needed distraction. Well, Benjamin23, congratulations on still being here. You must be one tough son of a bitch. I think George Patton would be proud. Thank you, by the way, for supporting the channel. I'm glad to, uh, to, to hear all of that is better. Ketoacidosis, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism. It sounds like an episode of House or something. My God, man. Well, I, I'm not drinking alcoholic beverages here, but if this was an alcoholic beverage and it is frosty water, I will say here's to you, sir, and here's to having you with us. So thank you. Well, now, man, I've got so many, I got so many letters. I got so many good letters from people, but you know what? Since it's the 200th episode, can you imagine what letter do you think I should start with? I don't know, people. Do you want to guess? Do you want to guess? Uh, what letter I should start with or what letter I should read. Let me see. Hmm, I wonder. Let me look down these letters and, oh, oh, look at this. Guess what I'm going to read to you all. Guess what I'm going to launch into because it's the 200th show and how could I not do, how could I do a show like the 200th show? So monumental. I understand why she didn't come on with me personally or, Live, I get it. I won't ask, but you know what? I got the next best thing. I got a letter from Willow Yang, ladies and gentlemen. And not only did I get a letter from Willow Yang, Willow Yang wrote a review of Spock's brain. 
generally considered to be one of the worst episodes of the original series. Frankly, I would say, and the children shall lead is absolutely the worst episode of Star Trek, the original series. And Spock's brain actually has a lot more to love about it. But my God, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. This is Willow Yang for the 200th episode of Rob Observations. First of all, Willow is a treasure. I want to thank, you know, it's been great meeting her, if only over the internet. Uh, a profound thanks to Willow for all of her great words and all of her great letters and allowing us to make a Willow Talk portion of the Burnettwork.net website. So thank you, Willow. And it wouldn't be a big show like this without you. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Willow Yang dissects Spock's brain. The first episode of the third season of the original series. Greetings, Rob. I wasn't initially going to write this, but you asked for it. So here it is. My take on Spock's brain. Honestly, what can I say about the episode that hasn't already been said? When I was a kid... I used to watch Pinky and the Brain on Nickelodeon. Unfortunately, back then, my English was still quite poor, and I wasn't able to understand much of the story itself. I did, however, remember the song in the intro where they'd repeatedly chant, brain, 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 brain. I had that refrain playing in my head as I watched the infamous season three premiere of the original series. Just how many times did they say brain in the episode? I count 37. I've tried rationalizing while I'm able to overlook certain absurdities over others. The notion of someone having their brain stolen really isn't all that out of the realm of scientific possibility. Brain transplants are currently being researched and developed and may very well be become a viable procedure within our lifetime. I think the main issue I have with Spock's brain isn't so much the premise, but the approach that was taken towards it. I just found it to be very lowbrow and juvenile. It really felt like the plot to a kid's cartoon, but punched up pseudoscience to make it remotely passable as adult science fiction. <laughs> Compound that with some hilariously awful dialogue, cheesy costumes, and campy acting, and we're left with the monstrosity that we got. Now, I will give credit where credit is due. Spock's brain does have a couple of decent moments, one scene that I appreciated was when the crew were trying to deduce the planet in the Sigma Draconis system that was most likely to contain the alien life forms that have made off with Spock's brain. <laughs> I thought the scene did an effective job of conveying the tension and stakes that were involved, with Kirk being burdened with the responsibility of making a call that might forever haunt him. I also liked the moment when the landing party beamed down onto Planet Six and Kirk instinctively called Scotty Spock before realizing that his first officer was no longer with him. That subtle gesture was effectively poignant and spoke volumes about their relationship. Unfortunately, subtlety was discarded for the remainder of the episode, which quickly devolved into laughable absurdity. <laughs> My favorite scene happened early on in sickbay when Kirk discovered that McCoy had put Spock on life support. Come on, Bones, demanded Kirk. When McCoy beat about the bush and telling him what was going wrong with Spock, what's the mystery? His brain is gone, replied McCoy in a horrified whisper. And right on cue, ominous music played, and I couldn't stop laughing. There was just an incong uh, incongruity between the serious faces of the actors and the preposterous words that were coming out of their mouths that made the scene incredibly hilarious. I have to applaud Shatner and DeForest Kelly for being able to keep a straight face as they uttered their lines. <laughs> Sadly, nothing in the remainder of the episode is able to quite top the unintentional comedic genius of the aforementioned scene, although there are more than a few memorable gems. The crew encounters a group of primitive cavemen on Sigma Draconis Six, the morgues, who wear clean cloth shirts underneath their furs and who apparently don't know what females are. Instead, they make reference to the others, whom they so eloquently call the givers of pain and delight. To be fair, that actually sounds like an accurate description that men have of women. Kirk decides to have McCoy beam down onto the planet with them, only to have McCoy bring a zombified remote controlled spot with him. So I guess he does so I guess he doesn't need to be on live support anymore. The landing party eventually comes across a cave that leads them underground, where they finally encounter those mysterious givers of pain and delight also known as the Imorgs, 
a group of women who dress themselves in tacky neon Barbie outfits and who apparently have the IQs of plastic dolls to boot. When Kirk and his crew presses them on the whereabouts of Spock's brain, the iMorg leader, Kara, responds perfectly with an irritated, Brain! Brain! What is brain? And <laughs> just when I thought the script has hit rock bottom, Kirk raises his hand dramatically in the air. Great leader, he exclaims, falling on his knees before Kara. We come from a far place to learn of your controller. <laughs> Again, I have to commend the actors for not bursting into laughter. I certainly couldn't control myself. I won't even try analyzing the iMorg's nonsensical ploy of having Spock's disembodied brain serve as the controller for their underground facilities. It makes about as much sense as to why a highly advanced civilization, though ion propulsion isn't really all that impressive and has existed in our world since the 60s, would opt to gender segregate themselves <laughs> in the event of an ice age instead of, I don't know, move to one of the neighboring planets or how Spock's medulla-less body can survive without any parent life support, or when Spock has suddenly become an expert neurosurgeon, <laughs> or, pardon me, or when McCoy has suddenly become an expert neurosurgeon, or Spock, I guess, yes, because he's leading the surgery of his own brain. For a Star Trek episode, Spock's brain can probably be best described as an epic failure. However, there is certainly something to be said for its remarkable, albeit unintentional, comedy. While the episode might be regarded as an embarrassment to some Star Trek fans, I have to applaud it. I have to applaud it for the joy that it has brought me. Spock's brain made me laugh. And even though it might have been for all the wrong reasons, I don't consider that to be a bad thing. Yours sincerely, Willow. Well, once again, Willow, let me just say you've made this channel a better place to be. Certainly, it's a better place for me to be because you're a part of it, and I want to thank you, and thank you for supporting the channel, not just through your Super Chats, but these letters, your words, how you've opened up and, and shown us uh, not, just, not just a part of yourselves, but or yourself, but you, you've shown us a part of ourselves as we have sort of been able to share in the way you look at the world. And I think we're all the better for it. So thank you very much. I very much appreciate everything you've done for us here and especially your eloquent, eloquent words, which never cease to cause me, at least, awe and wonder. So thank you very much for that. Uh, this is an interesting letter. Uh, this letter... This letter comes from Matthew Van Holten. And it's a little edited for clarity. But I like this. I like this letter a great deal. Uh, and I, I thought I would share it. Hey, Rob. Uh, so this is the first time I'm ever writing anything on a website. And the first time I'm ever writing anything to a YouTuber. I'm not sure if you've published your 200th video yet, but it should drop any day now. And I wanted to tell you, Congratulations. To say that you're my favorite YouTuber doesn't quite carry enough context to appreciate that sentiment. So let me elaborate. I got into entertainment YouTube partaking maybe, what, three or four years ago? I ended up stumbling upon the Collider channel and overall enjoyed their takes on things, but I especially loved his supreme sweatiness, Mr. John Schnepp. Rest in peace. I know a lot of them over there sometimes get branded as shills, and admittedly over time, some of their shows and panels do come off as fairly shilly, in my opinion. But overall, I love that. Fairly shilly. I love that. But overall, I think they tend to be good-hearted people just trying to leave their mark. I agree with you. Uh, it was through these Collider videos that I got recommended to the John Campia channel, which he had recently launched after his departure from Collider. For a while, I was a very avid watcher of his, although his delivery sometimes, and it took me quite some time to really put my finger on it, left much to be desired. You can tell he has a wealth of information from being around the industry and definitely a passion for it, but he can sometimes come off as smug and pedantic and even occasionally kind of gross, which is weird, and for me personally, a turnoff. I'll still give him a listen now and again, especially on those shows that you co-host, but he's lost some of his luster to me. It was around this time, maybe a year ago, that I started feeling some campia fatigue. I stumbled across Gary over at Nerdrotic and was introduced to the fandom menace. Those guys are kind of a kick to listen to, and I do really sympathize to an extent with the notion of fan first. I mean, 
After all, why do so many of these creators create, if not to hopefully appeal to the fans? Yes, sometimes for the artistry itself, but when you are talking about pop culture, I would say that art is, by necessity, as important as fan consideration. Otherwise, you're looking at more of an independent art house film, which might be wonderful, but it's probably not going to appeal to the masses and be commercially viable. But I digress. So on one hand, I have the Collider and John Campia viewpoints. These panelists and commentators absolutely know punditry, but again, I do often feel that they aren't as critical as critics perhaps ought to be. Then you have the relative extremism of nerdrotic or overlord DVD, and whereas sometimes that can be cathartic, I also don't think that they always give creators credit, quite enough credit. Which has become my oasis, what has become my oasis in this desert of tumultuously divided entertainment opinion? Why? Rob observations, of course. By the way, I did not write this letter, just so you know. In my opinion, Rob, you are that perfect balance between punditry and fandom. A true old school dyed in the wool movie fan who doesn't know punditry and doesn't just or doesn't just know punditry and doesn't just know fandom. But you know film and the artistry therein. What I also feel is that you know how to have a fun, engrossing, mature, insightful, and balanced conversation about pop culture, about modern day film themes, about the responsibilities of art mimicking life, and about the escapism for that art that sometimes doesn't mimic life. I love that during your broadcasts, we get little insights into your daily life, whether it be the leaf blowers going on outside, your critters crawling all over you begging for treats, the rare treat of Sophie coming on and espousing her ahead of her year's teenage wisdom. It's just really nice to have somebody who doesn't just have opinions, but also has the real world movie making experience to back up many of those opinions. You sometimes get political because how can we not in this modern day society? And though you feel very passionately about certain things, I think you maintain a cool head. And most importantly, you don't talk down to your audience. You truly do encourage a thoughtful and considerate diatribe and as such attract seemingly many different people from many walks of life. I'm looking at you, Willow, Stubble, and Paul from Long Beach, <laughs> who are privileged to consider themselves part of the post-geek singularity. I count myself amongst those select few, but thankfully ever-growing participants in this sort of serialized conversation that began way back on episode one. Sorry I wasn't around from the beginning, but I hope to be around for the many years to come. Matt Van Holten. Well, you know, um, I don't know what to say, Matt. You know, it's so nice to, to hear this kind of feedback because, you know, it's really interesting. When I started this channel, I didn't know what it was going to be. Like, again, I thought I was going to make these documentary pieces to just keep doing documentary work, but... Uh, it's a lot of work doing that. As a matter of fact, I just split up uh, Greg Smith, who's now become one of the moderators here. I split up the first episode of Rob Observations into three parts and dropped his cosplay work both on the Resistance flight suit, X-Wing fighter pilot suit, and the Boba Fett he did and building the one-to-one -one scale land speed. Uh, a lot of people hadn't seen that stuff and I thought it was cool and always worth sharing. It's kind of evergreen. You can always go back and watch. I love watching Greg talk about his costumes and talk about building things. He is going to embark, get this, our moderator, Greg Smith, and his team of also imagination connoisseurs are going to build a snow speeder. They already built a one-to-one -one scale replica of a land speeder. Now they're going to build a snow speeder from the Empire Strikes Back. How cool is that going to be? Uh, I want to be there when they transport that thing to the next Emerald City Comic Con. I think they're shooting for that this year, too. I mean, next year's Emerald City Comic Con, which is pretty amazing. So our moderator, Greg Smith, I don't know if he's in this chat, but if he is, the guy is going to build a snowspeeder, and he's hopefully going to share his build process with us. It'd be great. Maybe I'll have to fly up there and 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 spend another day with him shooting, even while he maybe go to one of his build parties and interview everybody else that's there. But uh, Matthew, I want to thank you very much. You know, as I said, the, the reason I did these things was sort of to connect with people. And also, you know, for myself, working on various projects uh, is has been like banging your head against a wall. And there's been a lot of good stuff, a lot of it I haven't been able to talk about yet, that has been happening career-wise and things that I've been working on, such as 
there's a there's a, a project that I can't really talk about that I'm working on. I was working on Friday and working on a little bit yesterday and today. That's a lot of fun. I get to work with a friend of mine who I've always admired that I've never worked with in this capacity before. Uh, Sky Fighter, the short film, has some really interesting developments. And the feature version of that that we were hoping the, the short would lead into, very interesting developments on that front. Tango Shalom, the feature I'm, I'm working on, just waiting on, on the sound. I've been waiting for a long time on the sound. A lot of good things happening. And what I wanted to do and what these chats have become, at least for me, is a way to stay connected with my excitement. Because sometimes, you know, working in this business, you really want to throw yourselves off a cliff sometimes or throw yourself. I don't want to throw anyone else off a cliff, but it gets, it can get a little disheartening and people don't call you back. And it really is like, I could go into any other business and have a steady paycheck and, and it wouldn't be as fun. It wouldn't be as gratifying, but it would, at least I would know what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And you wouldn't necessarily work on something. And after a year's worth of work, people's like, people would say, nope, not going to happen. So these chats and all of you people and everyone who supported the channel and the community that we've been building here. And I love the interaction on the website and, and uh, it's been great. And to me, that's what fandom is supposed to be. Uh, one of the great things when John Schnepp did ask me to go on Collider Heroes all the way back in April of 2015, I never considered myself a YouTuber. I didn't want to be a YouTuber. Um, I guess that's what I've become. By the way, I've been watching, I'm telling you, everything I'm learning about YouTube, I'm learning from Shelby Church now. Between John Campion, this YouTuber named Shelby Church, who started her own YouTube channel when she was like 14, but she she's written, written, she's done some good videos about how to work YouTube and how does it all, how do the analytics work? I've learned a lot. I don't know why I, I stumbled across her channel because I uh, she did a YouTube video not too long ago about her analytics. And I'm like, ah, that's interesting. But uh, I guess I am. I'm, 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 in, I'm in the YouTube space now, but it's really helped me uh, keep focus on, on my own passion. You know, sitting here talking to you guys every day and, and all the people that watch the show and, and then the people that communicate with me. Look, I've received some pretty horrible stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. When you put yourself out in public like this, you open yourself up to ridicule, ridicule. but I'm used to that. You know, when, when Free Enterprise came out 20 years ago, people either loved it or they hated it. There wasn't much of a middle ground. And, you know, you take your lumps. Whenever you've made something, you go out into public and start talking, running your mouth, you got to take the good with the bad. But most of the time, it's been pretty good. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I even learn, learn things from people that can't stand me or write me and tell me what a pretentious asshole I am. And I get it. I understand. But it's been a lot of fun. And most of the time, it's been wonderful. And it's really kept me energized. And it's kept my, you know, being at a point in my life that I am, middle age, one foot in the grave and all that, this has been sort of re-energizing for me and it keeps me connected to my childlike sense of wonder that at my age should really be withering and dying on the vine, but it hasn't because of you guys. And letters like Matthew's really, it makes it all worthwhile. So I thank you for the kind words and I trust that everybody knows that I did not write that letter myself. I swear to God, I did not. Um. This is an interesting letter. Again, these are going to, well, before I read that, let's see what anybody is saying. Uh, the uh, the <laughs> These letters are all over the place, but there's a lot of good ones. There's good ones from some of our favorite uh, letter writers as well. So stay tuned. John Suntress is here from the Word Balloon Podcast. Now, John, uh, another person I've never met in person, uh, but I've talked to him a lot via his podcast. I've been on his podcast a number of times. If you haven't listened to the Word Balloon podcast, you've got to listen to the Word Balloon podcast. John's out of Chicago, uh, especially if you're a comic book fan, but his podcasts are long, deep dives into many different subjects. He has people from across the spectrum, and I, I don't mean the, like spectrum in terms of behavior. I mean, in terms of, well, I guess in terms of behavior too. I'll just say across the spectrum because why not? It's not a problem being on anybody's spectrum, no matter what that spectrum is. But he's got a lot of really talented, insightful people that he's interviewed. He's a really good interviewer, and it's a lot of fun to be on a show. John is here. John says, congrats. Do you like the Orville? Are you excited for Hulu? Uh, John is asking about Seth MacFarlane's The Orville. You know, I, I like The Orville. I don't love The Orville. I like the cast. I like the characters. I like the show itself. I enjoy watching it, 
But my only real complaint with the Orville, and I'm sure it's going to start to change now that it is on Hulu, is I feel that it, it needs a little bit more of its own identity. It seems to me like even the, the big two-parter uh, and the, the timeline stories, they are doing Star Trek still. And I'd like to see them do... It's been a Star Trek homage. I'd like to see the Orville have more of its own identity and sort of move away from Star Trek type of stories and find out what kind of stories that are uniquely Orville stories. Um, but I like the Orville, and I think when they go to Hulu, it will free them up, like Seth MacFarlane has talked about. They're not necessarily locked into a running time. If they want to do an hour-long episode, they don't have to worry about uh, that. They can put on commercial breaks, but they're not, they're not limited by network programming standards. So I think that's going to be great. And I think they can be edgier. It's going to be really interesting. It was like watching Veronica Mars. By the way, I love the new season of Veronica Mars on Hulu. I hope they renew that show. But but it was interesting seeing more sexuality and hearing more bad language on Veronica Mars. I was like, oh, interesting. We're on cable. We're on streaming now. But yes, yeah, so I'm a big fan of the Orville. I'd like to see it continue. I'm a fan. Uh, CJ Dunn is here. Oh, snap, Willow. <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> shy princess. Hashtag princess post geek singularity. And hashtag bend the knee. Uh, Dieter Bastion says, even without negotiating it, you get five euros, Rob, for show number 200 without having to answer to anything. It's not show friends, it's Rob observations. Well, Dieter, I want to thank you for being on the show. Pretty good photo you had out there on social media, sir. Uh, I believe it was Dieter Bastion. I didn't know, I, I, I guess it just happened. Dieter Bastion took a picture with Kiss. And uh, for those of you who don't, don't uh, you might not remember, Kiss was the very first concert that I ever went to. I said Kiss Destroyer, but I guess it was Kiss Dynasty. I was corrected once, but that was my first. I went with Jeff Swafford and Pam Comstock when I was in the sixth grade. So it's always nice to see when somebody gets to meet Gene Simmons in full regalia. Ken Dixon is here. Ken Dixon says, congratulations on 200th. I just watched Endgame again. I get credits. I get credits for main cast. Why is Chris Pratt listed in the with? section with Redford and Sam Jackson. That's very, very interesting. So again, and, and this was when Okoye wasn't listed, when Denai Guerrero was not listed on the poster, people should know that the way people are credited in movies, it's certainly you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Now, it really depends I can't even begin to understand the complexities of who got what. But, you know, Chris Pratt, obviously, when they brought back the dusted, the de the, the decimated, they probably only worked a certain amount of time, or I don't know. It, it's all a contractual... I can't even imagine the nightmare of whatever deals they were able to wrangle for Avengers Endgame. Incredible. Because it doesn't necessarily spill over... You know, even though they made Endgame and Infinity War, they kind of shot a lot of it concurrently and there was a lot of crossover. How they made those deals is very interesting. I'd love to read, and they'll never announce this. You'll never be able to find out what, what the actual ins and outs of all, it, all of it were, but I would love to know. I'd love to know how did that all work. But at least for Endgame, Chris Pratt probably, because he wasn't in the movie very much, um, I, I, again, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how that works, but it, it, it does come down to contracts, probably screen time, salary options, those kinds of things. I have no idea what uh, what it was, but um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's very interesting. But again, that's all about uh, managers, agents, and lawyers, and the studio. So good catch. Really interesting. I'd love to know. Maybe he'll talk about that. The thing is, you're never going to get people really to talk about those things because it's in polite society, we don't ever get to know. But interesting, interesting, isn't it? Isn't it interesting to see how things work? And that's true of a poster too. You know, you don't just get to get put on a poster and your name on a poster. Wherever your name is on a poster and even the size of the font and how big your head is on a poster, all of that's negotiated. Believe it or not, it's all negotiated. So 
you know, people talk about, well, why are these Photoshop posters just floating heads or whatever? All of that has become very, very important. There's likeness approvals. It's a very a Byzantine process, but it's definitely something that goes on. You don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. It ain't show friends. It's show business. So, yeah. But I don't know. That's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Muadib. Muadib. Three words. I love that. Muadib says, hey, Rob, congrats on 200. Taking a break from bringing uh, from binging Mindhunter Season 2 to tune in. And well worth it, sir. Here's to the next 200. Cheers. Well, Muadib, right before I set up this chat, we just finished Episode 6 of Season 2 of Mindhunter. My God. I think Season 6 might even be better. Season 6. Episode 6. I think Season 2 of Mindhunter might be better than... Season one. What a phenomenal show. What amazing television. Chernobyl and Mindhunter season two are probably the finest things I've seen. I mean, even though it's streaming, I would call it TV. But my God, uh, the the level of sophistication and the acting, the acting on Mindhunter. Oh, oh, what? I just can't even imagine. It's so good. And seeing people like Carl Franklin and David Fincher knocking it out of the park, the writers, the actors. God, what an amazing season of TV. Just unbelievable. This is an interesting letter. This comes from Rob Crawford. From, from one Rob to another, greetings, RMB and the Post Geek Singularity. I don't even know how to spell verisimilitude or what it means. I thought you made it up, frankly, but what do I know? I'm approximately 19 years your senior, so what do I know? <laughs> I first saw you on the Campia show. I'm not sure how you put up with him. He's too serious about that of which he speaks. You're much more lighthearted, despite your Hollywood Bowl incident. <laughs> At one time, I wrote to and knew C.C. Beck. C. C. Uh, editor's note, Mike wanted me to say this. C.C. Beck created the original Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Shazam. He was born on the same day as Halley's Comet and the death of Mark Twain. He always said he'd die when the comet came around again, and so it became true. He was a talented man with a knack towards cartooning, and so was I. So we ended up working on some failed cartoon strips that never sold. We wrote to each other, me in longhand, he using a typewriter. And if I didn't hear from him, I called him. I will always cherish our friendship with CC. I wanted to discuss something that may or may not impact the movies that we love, and that's the end of comic books as we know them. DC Comics co-publisher Dan Didio complained recently that a deal struck with Walmart, either last year or the year before, where DC would put together 100-page giants, and within those reprints would be one new story. Didio got very pissed, saying that those Walmart comics are cutting into the profit of the current line of DC Comics. What? I'm old school. A profit is a profit. A win is a win. What's Didio still pissed off about? Apparently, the current line of DC Comics aren't selling well in the open market, but the Walmart product is. Instead of being pissed about it, perhaps Didio needs to get together with his staff and crew and figure out how they're screwing up their side of the industry. People are loving the Walmart reprints. They sell out every time. You can't get them anywhere else but Walmart. What's Didio pissed off about? Marvel Comics sells their line of reprint comics to Walmart. It's the first time in 50 years that comics are being sold where they used to be at retail stores. I remember when Walgreens sold comics in their stores when I was 10 years old. Aren't they the same company? Walgreens had a row of comics next to their lunch counter. 30 foot long, full of every comic you could think of. So what's Didio's problem? Thanks again, RMB. Been following you since about a week before Willow Yang sent her first letter. Is it still possible to be in love with someone like Willow from afar? Just asking. Thank you, Rob C. What a great letter. Well, Rob Crawford, I I gotta say, I'm I'm with you. Uh, first of all, 100-page giants are comics that are near and dear to my heart because when I was buying Justice League comics, I think it was Justice League 114, which is a 100-page giant-sized comic, and what they were 
was they were mostly reprints. And that's where I first encountered Earth 3 with the crime syndicate. And I love those 100-page giants. And as a kid, I read them over and over and over again. And I'll tell you, when you're going to Walmart, people are shopping at Walmart because it's tough getting by today. You know, whole families, they go to Walmart because they can save money. And, you know, when you go to Walmart and you go with kids, which a lot of people do, kids want toys, kids want something that parents can give them. And a 100-page giant size comic is something that's inexpensive and will provide hours and hours of entertainment. I know because as a kid, and you know as a kid, you'd pour over those things. And I, I think what's, what's really interesting is a place like Walmart, in my mind, look, I think Walmart... There's been a lot made in the news lately about how much they're making like $100 million an hour, the Walmart family is, or $10 million, some in, insane amount of money, whatever it is, whether it's $10 million or $100 million, they're making so much money. They're the richest family on earth, and the fact that a lot of their employees, there's let's just say there's a lot of wealth, uh, there's a lot of wealth distribution that can be made uh, amongst their employees, but unfortunately, we don't. We don't live in that society anymore because all kinds of regulations have been taken away. But that's a political issue. I, I won't get into that. But I do think it's pretty great to hear that these reprints are being sold. I used to go to a comic book store. It's been about 10 years. Actually, I'll tell you when I stopped. It was after Free Enterprise 2 went belly up. And we lost our funding because I was so – I was very disheartened after. This was back in 2010. Uh, in this summer, it was nine years ago this summer when, when Free Enterprise 2 went belly up. Uh, I was disheartened. I didn't want to go back to the comic book store. And and Sharon, who ran Golden Apple after her husband Bill died and, and Sharon's kids. And, you know, Golden Apple was a big part of my life. And I was so disappointed. I stopped going to comic book stores, really. I mean, I'll pop in now and again. But, you know, I stopped buying regular books. I still buy omnibuses. You know, I still love, I love any kind of really nice hardcover collection uh, of comics. There's a lot, there's a, there's a zero hour collection coming out in October and um, the absolute Grant Morrison's absolute Arkham Asylum is coming out. Uh, I still get all those things. I mean, I still love having those, those volumes because uh, I look at them more than my individual comics, but I, anything that gets people reading comics or getting people to buy comics, I think is a good thing. I understand that it's like everything. Everything that's physical, whether it's movies, I mean, they're going away. Physical books are eventually going to be gone, even though I love physical books. Why, when you can go to Comixology and you can get so many comic books so you can have subscriptions, and it's just the way of the world. I mean, I hate I hate to say it, but it's it's just the way of the world. But if places like Walmart can keep comics going, I don't think there's any reason to be angry. I understand they want they want new comics. Uh, I just I I think the economic model, as expensive as comics are, and and what you're getting for your buck. Um, imagine you're going to get a hundred pages of story. Imagine if you're an eight year old kid. You know, and you've been playing video games all your life, and you're, you're a product of the modern age, and you've never even really read a comic book. You're shopping with your mom at Walmart. She's able to buy or you or get you a 100-page comic for not a whole lot of money, not something that's going to break the bank, and it gets you reading. I think parents are, are if you're not going to be able to get a $50 video game, and your mom can buy you a $5 comic or maybe even an $8, 100-page comic that you really want, well, that's a gateway drug for kids as far as comics are concerned. I think it's a great thing. I'm with you, sir. Rob, you and I park our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay. And uh, the world is changing. And whatever we can do, look, I even lament. I, I look at uh, model kit sites like model kit building videos on YouTube. And I go to model stores or people like Starship Modeler or my favorite uh, Cult TV Man. Yes, there is a website called Cult TV Man. And they have a hobby store. I look at model videos the way some people look at pornography. Give me somebody's build video of the new Katinga class battle cruiser that came out. I have it sitting right there. Because like one day I'm going to build mine, but I have to watch all the videos. Kids today aren't building models, at least not in this country. I mean, there's some amazing, amazing uh, Jenik. If you've ever watched any of Jenik's videos, his model building is painting. Jenik is the Obi-Wan. No, he's better than Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's the Yoda 
of painting Gundam models or, or, or car models. And kids today aren't building models because even I, how could I justify spending months building the perfect 172nd scale, perfect grade Millennium Falcon model from Bandai and indeed the greatest model of the Millennium Falcon probably ever made, uh, at least in that scale. You know, why are you going to spend that much time and effort building a model when you can fly a photorealistic version of it in the new Battlefront video game? I mean, the world's changing. So I think that I, a, any way that you can keep, keep people buying comics, and, and it's reprint material too. I understand you're not making as much money off reprint material as you're making off original comics, but I think it's important. I think, I think that uh, anything to keep those things alive is a good thing. Getting, getting kids into reading through comic books, I mean, I think... That was certainly a way. It was a gateway for me. I read comics. I mean, I was reading books as well. But it's. I think it's important. I think it's a good thing. So I am, in fact, a big fan, big fan. So I think it's good. I think it's good. Dave Atkins says, "Congrats on 200 episodes. I was here from the start with AMC Heroes. You know, thank you for that. I was on when Collider Heroes started. It was AMC Heroes, and I started on that show on episode six. The great John Schnepp called me up and asked me to come down and do a guest stint where they were always bringing on guests and people seemed to like me. Uh, so I was asked to be more of a permanent fixture and I was on the show for three and a half years. And I miss John Schnepp every day. I wouldn't even be doing my own show. He was always he was the one that was saying, you know, the two people that were most encouraging of me doing uh, a YouTube chat show was first John Schnepp and then Elizabeth, who actually bought me this microphone. <laughs> she bought me this Yeti mic and had I, I, she didn't buy me this Yeti mic. I probably wouldn't be here now. And, um, so yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I didn't finish reading your chat. He said, congrats on 200 episodes. I was here from the start with AMC heroes. Thanks for always being a friendly face and an all around great guy. Here's to 200 more. Well, Dave, thank you very much. Just so you know, I can be a prick too, I guess. But uh, I appreciate what you're saying. <laughs> I very much, very much appreciate it. I thank you so very much for that. And thanks for being here, and thanks for continuing to watch me. After, can you believe it's four years now? I guess I've become a YouTuber. Um, amazing! It's amazing. Uh, David Cabrera is here. He says, "Here's to 200 more, good sir, and the post geek singularity." Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. Uh, Odai. Oh, let me see if I get this right. Odai. Alamani, Alamani, Alyamani, Alyamani, Odai Alyamani. What a cool name. Odai Alya, Odai Alyamani. I like that. Uh, 200 RMB. Thank you for helping me understand myself a bit more this year. I will cherish the first 200 and look forward to the next 1,000. <laughs> Peace and love. OA. Oa. I love that. So your 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 name is actually you could do a whole Green Lantern riff on that. Well, Odai, thank you very much. And I love the thank you for helping me understand myself a bit more. That's that's a very nice thing for you to say. I I that was not my intent, but I want to I I just I want to thank you so much for that. Uh wow, Chuck Philpot. Wow, Chuck doesn't say anything, but man, he supports this channel. Wow, Chuck, that's I I am I am I am humbled. Uh, I feel though that I should pontificate about something that you wanted me to pontificate for, but that it's that's very humbling and very touching that you would support the channel uh, in that way, Chuck. I very much appreciate that, very very much. Thank you. Um, and it's true, you know, one of the things that I'm going to be doing is I've been threatening to do this. I've got, I have Wirecast, which is software. I've even got this. You can't really see it. I wonder if I can pick it up. I've got this control board. Now this control board is the same control board. It, it literally is like, I'm holding it upside down because I can't really go over, but this is the Wirecast control board. And it literally is like having a television studio that I can switch around. And John Campia, you can get a, a feel of, John Campia is really good at doing it. I've been sort of scared. <laughs> I mean, you know, with editorial software, I'm surrounded by all this great technology, but this, it would be, you know, I'm doing a lot of this. I think I want to switch uh, switch to doing to using this and sort of bringing up the production value and adding more cameras. If I ever move into my garage, which I call my Imaginarium, uh, I'd have a whole set there. It'd be more like Joe Rogan, but I could do more in my garage. I've sort of set up. I've kind of got a C shape of a bunch of Billy bookshelves. I've got a bunch of like uh, floor to ceiling books. 
uh, graphic novels, hardcovers, action figures. It's really where I wanted to move the show into from the beginning. Um, it's just problematic from a technical standpoint. I've got to run more power in there and it gets really, really hot because it is the, a garage and it's not that insulated. But I'd love to move in there and I'd need to get bigger lights and more cameras, kind of like what John has. But I think it'd be a lot more fun because what I'd like this show to be, to be honest, is more like Joe Rogan's show. I don't know what you, you guys would think about this, but here, I, this is just me talking and and I think it would be a lot of fun. Like there's some people I really want to have come on the show. Kevin Rubio, I'm going to have come on the show who made Troops and really uh, started the modern fan film movement. My friend, Michael Davis. Uh, Michael Davis, who directed, wrote and directed the film Shoot 'Em Up. He also made Eight Days a Week. He's been working on a project for the better part of the last half decade that is amazing. And I know, who doesn't love Shoot 'Em Up now? I'd love to have him come on. There's a lot of people I know that I'd love to ha come on and do it'd be it'd be sort of a live show but it would be it, we'd have more of a discussion more of a joe rogan vibe or a dave rubin vibe where we could sit down and talk to people for a long time and uh i would like to do that so so chuck the donations you make we try and put some of that money back into what we'll do with the show to get more lights and get more equipment and things like that because you know john campia is constantly if you look at next time if you guys watch the john campia show notice the the his his camera setup like the one he does for himself that's on me right now this camera setup john recently got a new camera but he also got a a really cool lens and his lens is uh it's a fixed it's a prime lens so it's got a fixed focal length so he doesn't have a lot of room to move in terms of focus but it gives it gives him a really unique look a lot of people don't think about that a lot of people aren't shooting their youtube shows with prime lenses because it's difficult. But pop on to John's show and take a look. And, and one of the things I've learned from John is John is constantly trying to make his show better from a technical standpoint, which I certainly appreciate. And um, it's great. It's pretty cool. So Chuck, once again, thanks for the generous support of the channel. It's very nice of you. Just Plain Steve is here. Just Plain Steve says, happy 200 episodes, Rob. Here's to the next 200. Well, <laughs> oh, die wants me to go a thousand. Thanks for uh, I like I'll get to the next two hundred. It'll be great. But you know what? I, I I'm gonna drink to Odai's sentiment. I should do this for the next thousand. But hopefully, if I do a thousand more, eventually I'll be doing daily broadcasts from a set that I'm directing. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, Res Canyon. Uh, <laughs> congratulations with Z. I guess get uh, uh, what I don't know. I don't know if that. If that what that means g is that a gz i guess congratulations on 200 rob curious if you're a disc world fan that's terry pratchett's series you know what i love terry pratchett but i haven't i've read one disc world novel and it the name of it is eluding me now but i do have it in the garage i think it was the first disc world novel and i don't know it's funny because i always i always um mix up larry niven's ring world series and disc world but Terry Pratchett's a very different writer than Larry Niven is, so I shouldn't. But um, I was a fan, and I I've, I just need to read more. But I just I love Terry Pratchett. But thank you again for those well wishes and supporting the channel. It's very nice of you, very nice of everybody, by the way, uh, to, to do that. Uh, Mark C. Mark Chure is here. And Mark C., again, Mark C. is a vibrant and uh, supportive and very active member of the Post-Geek Singularity community. I've appreciated him over the last, well, eight months. I can't believe I'm doing this eight months. Mark is here. Mark C says, actually, Rob, pertaining to comic books, digital sales are not the issue. In fact, digital sales are decreasing. The issue is writers today seem not to understand what it means to be a hero. Well, that, you know, that could be. I, I, I think in a way, um, I think Mark has a good point. You know, I, I'm tired, I, I, I'm kind of tired in a way, like, look, I love my anti-heroes, I love nuanced heroes, I love people that are um, morally conflicted, so to speak. But, you know, in some ways, uh, I like traditional heroes as well, and we seem to be living in a world now where that's frowned upon, uh, kind of the same way I think being really good at your job 
Like, I think one of the problems with Star Trek, for instance, and I think a lot of people might have these problems with the ambiguity they want to inject into their superhero characters, uh, is, is that the idea of being uh, being an earnest hero is somehow now frowned upon. And, and it's interesting to me because I think that Steve Rogers, as he is portrayed in the MCU, they've done a really good job of having Captain America stand up for his beliefs, even when there are people fighting against those beliefs. And it's interesting. There was that letter that was written a couple of days, well, last week, that the difference between, you know, I think it was Kevin Rubio's letter, was talking about Superman and, and uh, Captain America. And... Um, Maybe it wasn't Captain. Maybe it wasn't Rubio's letter, but well, I think it was. And and I think that yeah, I think people are are forgetting how to write heroes because that kind of earnest heroicness is frowned upon now. And also, look, I believe in in uh, I believe in being when you say the word elite. There's a connotation that goes along with that word now that is like, oh, the elites. Like these are people sitting up on Mount Olympus that are that are sitting there with their piles of money um, and, and, and putting one over on the rest of us. But you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being the best of the best. Uh, I admire Willow for, for uh, being going out and getting her PhD because to me, PhD is the, is the elite title. When you're a scientist or a doctor, getting your doctorate means you studied really hard. And you've done something that's worthy of celebration, perhaps writing a Klingon opera over. And I don't like that our society, our civilization is frowning on the people. We need the elite. We need the best of the best to be out there on the front lines solving the problems. And I mean that at every level. I don't just mean doctors and lawyers. I mean everywhere. We need elite teachers. We need elite caregivers. We need elite, whether you're a plumber. Look, if I, if I call a plumber, I want the best plumber. I want somebody that lives and breathes plumbing. And I think that we as a society are frowning upon that kind of knowledge. Everybody wants to believe, oh, that they're somehow equal. You know, I, I like meritocracies. Uh, while I do think that we need um, equal opportunity, everybody should absolutely be free to pursue whatever it is that they want to pursue, regardless of gender, color, religion, sexual preference, whatever. I think, now, as I've said before, if I want to be a, a basketball star on the LA Lakers, well, I should be free to try out, but I do not believe in equality of outcome. I don't think anybody should ever hire me to be on any NBA team, even when I was playing basketball in high school. I wasn't that good. And, and I think that there's nothing wrong with, with that. Um, but I believe that we have to provide an equal opportunity for everybody to, to, to pursue their dreams. But there's this weird thing happening where, where uh, somehow being really good at your job isn't necessarily a good thing because, oh, that means that somebody else is being diminished in some way. I don't believe that at all. Like I've always said, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about how uh, I worked for this director. He was very arrogant. He was the original director of Free Willy. His name's Robin Armstrong. And he was a very, very smart guy. Uh, what he wasn't smart doing was to quit Free Willy over script issues six weeks before they began production. And the movie was taken over by Simon Windsor. I continued working on the film, but Robin Armstrong went off on his own. He had made one other, to this day, he's only made one movie in his life. Well, one movie like this it was called Pastime. And I've talked a lot about one of the reasons I wanted to come work for him later was in the movie, there was a character, a coach played by Noble Willingham that's telling William Russ, this over-the-hill uh, minor league pitcher who's being threatened by a young up-and-comer. Noble Willingham says in the movie, he's trying to tell William Russ, he says, look, how good someone else is doesn't make you any better or any worse. And I really took that to heart. That's one of my favorite things I've ever heard in a movie. And I don't. I might be even paraphrasing. It's been so long since I've seen the film, but I was always struck by that. Like, there's no reason to um, to feel uh, jealous or, or of somebody for for being good at their job, or to think that 
someone else's success or ability has in any way, shape, or form uh, any bearing on you. You know, and and I I believe in elitism in the extent to the extent that I love seeing people that are great at their jobs. I, I really do. I love meeting people that are really smart that know their stuff, and and I think we should be holding those people high on a pedestal because in this day and age. We need smart people. We need clear, th clear thinkers. And we need to support the idea that other people should be encouraged to become great in whatever it is that they want to do. And, and I think we need more of that. Um, and I think, Mark, that's, that's this idea, and it permeates our culture, you know, that we want to, we want to, we want to destroy our heroes. You know, we want our heroes to have feet of clay. I guess that's more dramatically interesting. But when I'm reading, I don't want to read or watch television. I don't want to watch Star Trek and have it about problematic characters. The problems are the allegorical difficulties they get into through the course of the plot that reflect back on us. But our characters, what I've loved about Star Trek, it's always about it's the main characters are always the best of the best. And that was the thing that always appealed to me you know kirk spock and mccoy might bicker amongst themselves but they were the best at their chosen fields and and they needed to be the best because the problems they had to solve were enormous they were galaxy spanning sometimes the galaxy itself was threatened and you needed the best of the best to be out there and i think we're losing some of that in our society and that being good at things and being smart is somehow being frowned upon i think it's weird but anyway mark i think uh what it means to be a hero is absolutely true willow yang says uh i've only seen two episodes of mine too but i'm glad that you loved it and yes i'd much rather walk, watch spock's brain than those demon children <laughs> that you're referring to and the children shall lead because yes that episode is so bad so bad hail hail fire and snow call the angel we will go far oh, terrible joseph is here joseph from Vesna's neck of the woods. Joseph says, Joseph says, Rob, Pringles or Lay's? And the chat say Pringles. Okay. Pringles are not Lay's. They're not Lay's potato chips. You know what? Lay's, Lay's barbecue chips have been a constant in my life. Uh, I love barbecue. Right now, next to me, uh, I haven't been eating them, but I have kettle brown, brown potato chips right here. I like kettle. These are the backwood barbecue. I enjoy them. They also make like a hickory smoke smoked barbecue. I could write a whole dissertation on barbecue potato chips, but Lay's, no one can eat just one. Pringles, here's the thing about Pringles. I, it's silly to say this about potato chips because potato chips are all processed food anyway, which I understand. But I, I became a potato chip connoisseur the first time I went to Hawaii when I was a kid. Um, we went on vacation uh, when I was very young. I think I was eight Eight, the first time I went to Hawaii, and Hawaiian potato chips, which which were these thick potato chips, I'd never tasted them before. Um, they're fantastic. Now I, I'm gonna it, 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 look. I don't normally have. Well, maybe I do. I'm gonna show you what I currently think are my favorite as far as barbecue potato chips go. And again, they should give me. They should pay me for endorsements. But I'm gonna these right now. This isn't open. But Hawaiian kettle style potato chips, the Luau barbecue. These are just these are these are wicked spicy for over the counter potato chips, and they have a sweetness to them, just like you'd expect. They're not as thick as I would like. However, these are my favorite barbecue potato chips. Now, the thing about Pringles is Pringles seem too too artificial for me. Maybe it's the perfect wave. I mean, they feel like they were generated as opposed to cut from real potatoes. Maybe that's just me. Now, I do like, to be fair, I do like Pringles barbecue potato chips. I do. And I really like the fact that you can perch them on your tongue and you can rub your tongue back and forth on the potato chips to get the barbecue flavor and suck it all off. I mean, look, I could, I could go on and on and on about how I like to eat barbecue potato chips. I could also do the same thing with Oreo cookies. So all of this is a, it's a, it's a, I know it's an oral fixation thing. Say that, say about this, what you will about me. I don't know what it means, but if you want to get me off on a potato chip tangent, and you certainly have, I, 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 Pringles are my last resort. I really prefer the 
t- potato chips are like snowflakes. No potato chip is exactly the same, but Pringles are. And you know, there's a there's a certain joy in life when you bring back a bag of potato chips that you bought at the grocery store, and most of them are intact. Like I really get bummed out. Like if you're going on a picnic or you're doing something, and a bag of potato chips gets smashed, and you're just left with basically crumbs. I don't like that. I like uh, I always try and get the back of the potato when I when when there's like a uh, ba- like if there's five deep of these Hawaiian luau uh, uh, luau barbecue chips. I won't take the first bag out because I figure somebody tried to reach it and drop it. So I always go for like the third or fourth bag. Hopefully that they'll have the most unbroken chips. I know that's little a little bit of an aside, but a letter writer earlier said like they they liked it when I talked about my life. So there you go. Now you can do a psychological profile on me based on my potato chip habits. <laughs> so Joseph, got to go with Lay's, but Lay's to me, uh, Lay's are, I, I'm now much more into the gourmet. I only eat barbecue potato chips, although I do like salt and vinegar, and I do like, Kettle makes a lot of really interesting chips. Dijon mustard. I do like the kettle chips quite a bit, actually, to be honest. Uh, Vegetable Tube says, well, thank you, Vegetable Tube. Congratulations on 200. Love your channel. I'm sure after Vegetable Tube wrote in, he's like, why did I tune in to listen to Rob pontificate about his potato chip eating abilities? <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I think that's pretty funny. Um, now this is an interesting one. This one comes from James M and, uh, this is about physical media and I really enjoyed this letter. So this comes from James M Rob with the 200th episode of Rob's observations. I cannot help but think of the future and how it always brings change with it. More specifically, the change to come in the world of physical media. I'm wondering, is it possible or even probable that the future will be in some streaming sites allowing their subscribers, only the ones paying not to be confused with the temporary free trial subscribers, to buy DVDs that would be made on demand so they don't lose money on it, of the content available only on their site? For example, Disney Plus has a Hawkeye show. I'm a paying subscriber, but I love physical media and would like a copy of the show. So I fill out a form, which would include the payment information and all that good stuff to purchase the Hawkeye show. They make it on demand and mail it to me, emailing the tracking information with receipt. Do you think something like this is in the cards for physical media? James M. Well, James, that's interesting. That's an interesting idea, but I have to say no. Um, The problem, what what the studios want to get rid of is they want to get rid of shipping. They want to get rid of replication costs and that whole area is going to go away. And, and and even the idea of ownership, owning these things, because, you know, when you have physical media, you can show, you can show things to people whenever you want. The studios don't get a piece of that. Every time you watch something on a streaming service, there's some kind of a, a uh, indication of that. Now, sure. You could say with DVDs and, and Blu-rays now with our players, they're all connected to the internet. That could be the, the case as well. But at the end of the day, they want physical media to completely go away. And you know what? In 20 or 30 years, the idea, assuming that the you know the Russians don't finish their hypersonic nuclear-powered missile and start shooting them all over the planet, and we have to worry about I mean, it's unbelievable to me that people are building hypersonic nuclear weapons. Because what are you gonna do? You know, didn't we didn't we already figure out that living in our closed biosphere that all kinds of nuclear war is just bad? It's going to end in, it'll end in tears, as uh, the This Mortal Coil album was titled. Uh, you know, it, it. I just think, unfortunately, physical media is, is going away. It's going to go away permanently. People talk about, look, vinyl and all of that, I can see vinyl is just not that expensive to produce. But you have to be able, making movies is a lot more uh, difficult. Putting movies on physical media, there's a lot more that needs to happen. And I just think that, Look, we're still going through a period of time. In 20 or 30 years, physical media, people aren't even going to want... Look, I I dread moving, you know, because even just if you went by the omnibuses that I own, the omnibuses are, are back-breaking to move, <laughs> you know? Um, if I were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, Elizabeth would think to herself, what the hell am I going to do with all of these books? 
I mean, she could just come online and talk to all of you and she'd be sending them out. But even the postage for all that would take forever. But I, I just think that all that kind of we come from a world where physical media exists. But imagine if you're born once once everybody who lived in the world of physical media is gone. No one's going to miss it. No one's going to be like, oh, they'd much rather have it streaming. As a matter of fact, the idea of even getting up, even me, you know, I've got all my Blu-rays right next door and I'll be flipping through the channels like last night. I'm like, oh, hunt for Red October. You know, I think we were, on, we, we were on Stars or something. And I'm like, Elizabeth does not like Hunt for October. I'm like, Hunt for October. I can just click on it. Now, I could get up and walk the five feet to my shelf where Hunt for October lives, take it down, put it in, and listen to it. And it'll sound, you know, my thunderous surround sound system, whatever. But, hey, if it's on streaming, I can just hit a button. And I can watch, like, just 10 minutes of Marco Ramius. When Cortez went to the New World, he burned his ships. You know, if I could just watch that scene, you know, I wouldn't have to take a disc out. So I love physical media. I think it's going to go away. I don't think they're ever going to do that. Although I do like your idea. I like the way you think. I like the way you think. Um, speaking of Mark C., Mark C. also wrote a letter. Got a letter from Mark Chure right here. And uh, I'd like to read it. It's a good letter. Greetings, Rob and Imagination Connoisseurs. Maybe it's just me, but as I listen to this channel, I get the impression that some believe toxic fans who follow channels like Geeks and Gamers, Mecha Random, or Ethan Van Skyver can't possibly love the properties they blast and seem to want to end. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is going to be a long one. Well, Mark C., you've earned it. I myself saw Star Wars in 1977 at the age of four. From that showing through its fourth re-release in 81, I saw the film a total of eight times. For six years, I ate off Star Wars plates, slept under Star Wars sheets, and with the action figures and toys, created some of my best adventures ever. In the 90s, as the trilogy began to pick up steam again, so did I. I saw The Phantom Menace ten times in the theater. When Attack of the Clones came out, I was in a car wreck on the way to the theater, I promised the tow truck driver an extra $50 to get there fast so I could get to the show. The tow truck driver actually dropped me off in front of the theater. <laughs> Except for the Disney films, I've managed to camp out overnight for first showing tickets. This isn't love, it's a marriage. So that said, let me set up a fantasy scenario as to how the toxic fan feels. It's November 1980. And a concert promoter has managed to book an annual Beatles concert where all four members of the Beatles are going to attend. Now, imagine watching, watching this show only to learn by the end that the promoter decided to never put the four of them on stage at the same time. Paul didn't even play. He just came out at the end to tell everybody goodnight. <laughs> this is a pretty good analogy, actually. Now, this is an annual event, but John is shot and killed a month after the show. So the opportunity to get all four together can never happen. Well, at least next year, the remaining three will be there and the concert will showcase Paul. Now, I want you to imagine how upset a Beatle fan would be if in the next year, George and Ringo came out and played gospel tunes and Paul McCartney came out and didn't play Beatles tunes either. He didn't play Wings tunes. He didn't play any classic solo material. Instead, Paul came out and did an hour and 45 minutes of rap that didn't even seem to discuss anything topical and didn't seem to even keep a good rhythm. Would it be, be an interesting show? Oh, I'm sure. But did you, as a Beatles fan, get the Beatles concert you expected to promote and deliver? The, uh, did you expect the promoter to deliver? How would you feel towards the promoter when you realize not only did they let it happen, in some cases encouraged it, now, imagine you were displeased and vocal about that displeasure online. In response, the promoter's office pool called you a racist for not liking Paul's rap or a man baby and the worst type of toxic fan there is. Would you give that promoter your hard-earned money for the third annual Beatles concert or any other concert they promote from that day forward? This is what a toxic fan feels anger for. It's not just a bad show. It's how not taking advantage of the situation led to them not just messing things up. And because of their actions and life intervening, now it can't be fixed. As you said, the studio doesn't care about legacy and canon. They just want to make money. A toxic fan hopes 
that if enough decided not to open our wallets, maybe they will think twice about their position and hopefully course correct. I hope The Mandalorian is that course correction. I hope an Obi-Wan movie or a series is a step to give fans something they want to see. The issue is, until this point, all of Star Wars has revolved around the axis that is the Skywalker family. That promoter might follow up the annual Beatles concert with great shows from the Rolling Stones and James Taylor. But would that be enough to make up for screwing up a Beatles reunion and them calling you a racist for not liking the show? Time will tell. May the force be with you, Mark C. Well, okay, Mark. First of all, I love the Beatle anal Beatles analogy. I thought that was good. But then I think you kind of went off the rails because you you brought in a bunch of other things that weren't weren't really a part of that analogy. First of all, I, I think the analogy is great. And as I have said, I think one of... the Here's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is if Disney, first of all, did not buy Star Wars, I know we can say that George Lucas was thinking about doing a new trilogy, but there really wasn't any new Star Wars in the cards in terms of films beyond, I mean, they were doing Clone Wars. You can't go back and say what might have happened, woulda, shoulda, coulda. We can speculate all we want. But George Lucas is getting older. You know, he doesn't want to. Uh, spend all of his time dealing with Star Wars, I think, for the rest of his life. There's other things he wants to do. He, he's a philanthropist as well. Um, and I think, on one hand, giving Star Wars, selling Star Wars to Disney, or, or anyone, George Lucas could not have sold Star Wars to anyone who wouldn't have probably done a similar thing. Because the first... Anyone who has four million bucks to buy Star Wars is going to be thinking the same thing. They're going to be thinking, well, to keep Star Wars going for another 40 years, we're going to have to reinvent Star Wars for a new generation that, uh, I mean, let's face it, like you and I, you were four, I was 10 when I saw Star Wars. We're, we're not traditionally the demographic that's buying merchandise, that's doing all of the things that we were doing when we were kids. I mean, even though, let's face it, uh, we are, but uh, there's a lot of people that aren't, and the world has changed. Look, I'm watching a lot of these. These any, anyway. So that's that's one point. Let me let me just. So so I I, I really I, I get what you're saying, and I think the greatest mistake they made was we did not get a Star Wars movie with all of our beloved characters. For the how do you make a movie about the Skywalker saga and not give us a movie? with our, our, our characters at least having one last adventure together. I will say, I think that was a horrible miscalculation. And that was something that Disney, I'm sure, mandated. We have to create new characters. And certainly J.J. Abrams, you know, he wanted some cheddar. He's like, I, I, I have, uh, I'm more motivated to collect b cash from all the characters that I've created from whole cloth than to give somebody money uh, for characters that I don't own. See, this is the thing that this is the thing that people aren't quite understanding. Everything that J.J. Abrams collects, he gets to have some kind of sway over. It's not just work for hire for Disney. Whether it's Star Trek or Star Wars, what they're doing is they're carving out a piece of that for themselves. J.J. Abrams was like, "Sure, I'll come work on Star Wars, but I want—I don't know what his piece is. I can't even speculate. Uh, whether it's five percent or ten percent." we get 10% of the merchandising revenue or 5% of the merchandising revenue of every new character we create. And by the way, or, or we're not going to work on that. And when you spent $4 billion, the acceptable people that you can have come work on these movies, it is a very, very small group of people. It's a very small group of people that a studio deems worthy of working on these projects. And that's what people have to understand. So when, and the, the, the people, the, that small group of people, knows that they're part of that small group of people and they're all driving that kind of a bargain. They're all saying, yeah, it's Star Wars. It's the most lucrative entertainment franchise you can possibly work on and I'm happy to do it. I've been a Star Wars fan my whole life. However, you've got to make it worth my while because you're not going to pay me some exorbitantly high sum of money because you're Disney. You know, I'm not going to command a $25 million sal, or maybe they did, but I doubt it because it's still a risk. So they're not going to be paying him $25 million and whomever else. They're not going to be, uh, however much they paid Han and uh, or Harrison and, and Carrie and Mark Hamill to come back because they had to 
pay those guys through. The, it's a huge anyway. You don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. So it was a money making enterprise from the get go. And I'm sure JJ's mandate was we need new characters. We need new characters because the new characters are going to further this franchise. And we can't even bet on three movies over the course of, in, in our case, we're basically getting from the time the first movie was released, it's not it's not three years apart. So it's not a total of nine years between three movies. They, of course, couldn't have that either. So there, there are business concerns um, from the get-go that aren't even, forget the fans, forget what you're dealing with in terms of, of what the fans expect and what they want. I think in order to have kept their franchise as healthy as they wanted it, they needed to give us one last kick-ass movie with all the characters. They did the best they could. Harrison Ford probably mandated that he had to die. Why Harrison Ford did not go out in a blaze of glory uh, behind the controls of the Millennium Falcon, I will never know. Um, but he should have. If that's the way you're going to do it, that's the way you do it. You take them out. In a, in a spectacular way. The same thing was true of Kirk. He should have gone out on the bridge of the Enterprise, whatever that was. But but uh, so they didn't give us that. And I think that's a mistake. And you introduce those characters and their relationships. If if those new characters were introduced the way, say, Lando Calrissian was introduced in The Empire Strikes Back, if you had a group of new characters that were introduced, I mean, they kind of did that, but they didn't do it well because the, the thing they deprived us of, like you said in your analogy, was they deprived us of that last Beatles concert, which was dumb. It was dumb. And, and, and that was something they should have given us. And what they did was none of those characters, Luke, Leia, Han, R2, 3PO, I mean, maybe Chewbacca is the only one, but none of the, the original trilogy characters were well served by these new movies. That is their biggest error. In my, in my estimation, that was a mistake. But since we're not just talking about Star Wars, we're going to go back in and talk about toxic fandom here. The difference is this. Once you've made that opinion known, here's what I don't like, is that I liked Last Jedi. Is Last Jedi perfect? No. I liked Luke's arc for Last Jedi. The problem is, is when someone comes after me or comes and went after a lot of people, you know, your people that went after Kelly Marie Tran and talked about how shitty her character was and and badgered her online as if as if think about it from her perspective. She grows up in a world where she loves Star Wars. She gets hired to play a new character, Rose Tico, in a Star Wars movie. Dream come true. She didn't write the character. She didn't direct the character. She didn't come up with the storyline. She just gets to be in a Star Wars movie, which was the, the dream of any actor especially a young actor, especially an actor of Vietnamese descent. You know, it's an amazing thing. What happens? Well, if people don't like the way the movie goes, they blame her and they attack her online. I mean, I watch these things going after Kathleen Kennedy, you know, as, as if it's very funny to me, these fan sites, they don't know shit about what it's like to produce a movie. They don't know anything. They don't know how the day-to-day -day goes. And they're, well, you know, she, Kathleen Kennedy's not a creative producer. It's like, I, I, I watch this stuff and it makes my gums bleed. I'm like, oh, I want to get in there and go, you have no idea what you're saying. When these people, uh, you know, that's why uh, when I was doing Kathleen Kennedy videos and coming out in support of her, I'm like, I've admired Kathleen Kennedy for the better part of three decades, you know, and, and she has been a part of all of these movies. And it's such a weird thing when people say that, oh, you know, she's not doing anything. I'm like, you don't know how a movie's produced. I mean, it's as simple as that. So we have, we have. I, I think the problem with the the fan community is, especially a lot of people that are very vocal in the fandom menace side, have never themselves worked in the entertainment business, and they don't have any true understanding of what working in the entertainment business is like. And and it's it's the 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 way people expose their ideas. Uh, especially a lot of the time they're just talking out of their ass. And, and, and that to me is, is when you're, when you're attacking Kathleen Kennedy, Kathleen Kennedy's work with some of our great filmmakers and to sit there and say uh, that she's not a creative producer. I mean, no, Kathleen Kennedy is, she does her job and, and, and her, her resume is one of the best in Hollywood. And yet uh, I watch our fan community literally destroy her because they didn't, they're not, I guess, ultimately what bothers me about, about all this is you can have whatever idea you want. Like you just said, I love this analogy about the Beatles and as it applies to 
our original Star Wars characters. I I, I think, but what what you're uh, not taking into consideration is the with this analogy is what if the Beatles wanted the way the promoters doing what the Beatles? You know, I'm a huge Prince fan. Uh, I love his latter discography. A lot of people don't know it. Duran Duran. You know, I was uh, uh, Duran Duran has put out a lot of really great music in the last 20 years. A lot of people don't know. People are saying to me, you know, why was Duran Duran playing Houston for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing? I'm like, well, they did put out an album called Astronaut in the mid aughts. And people are like, what? I go, yeah, they put out an album called Astronaut. I mean, everyone knows Planet Earth, which is on their first album in the early 80s. But were you buying their album Astronaut in the aughts? Well, perhaps not. Red Carpet Massacre, you know, things like that. Paper, uh, Paper Gods, their last record. So there's also what the artists want to do. Now, in the case of Star Wars, they spent $4 billion. They're trying to make easy decisions. Uh, a studio is not in the, in, in the habit once you've spent $4 billion to tell their stockholders that, yeah, we're going to take a, a big chance. We just spent $4 billion to acquire Star Wars. They have to, from, corporate, from a corporate standpoint, mitigate their risks. They don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. So from a spreadsheet point of view, and remember, they're not fans. They're sitting there thinking, okay, we need to create new characters that we can merchandise. We got to create a BB-8. We don't need R2-D2. Everybody knows R2-D2. How do we get somebody excited about a new astromech droid? Well, we'll we've got this new technology. We can do this spinning thing. It'll be really interesting. So BB-8 is born. J.J. Abrams hears about this. I think it was Bob Iger who told him about this technology. Suddenly, yeah, let's use that. You know, we'll, we'll have a new fighter pilot. We'll make amalgamations of our old characters. And that's, from a business standpoint, a smart thing to do. You can't sit there and go, yeah, remember Star Wars when Luke, Khan, and Leia were in their 20s and 30s and they were awesome? Well, now if we're going to make Star Wars, yeah, let's make people that are in their 60s and 70s and we'll get, we're will get going to get the kids to buy off on that. Well... The answer is yes. Yes, you would have. You would have. The whole world would have bought off on it. And I believe if they had had the original trilogy characters in one last hurrah, that movie would have made even more than the $2 billion it made. It would have made 2.5 or maybe $3 billion. But it just wasn't satisfying. So I get where you're coming from. But the difference is, um, the difference is, it's the way fans treat one another and it's the way they treat their creators. I mean, the vitriol that is lobbed at people like Ryan Johnson. Do you think Ryan Johnson wants to make a bad Star Wars movie? Does Kelly Marie Tran want to play a character that people hate? No. I mean, they're all trying to do... Kelly Marie Tran was hired to, to play the character that was written on the page for her to play. She can't raise her hand and go, you know, I, I, think, this, I think this whole side journey to Canto Bight... It kind of ruins the whole tension of this slow chase in space. I mean, why would you want to do that? It's not her place to say that. She just has to give play the part as written. And I think that there is a, a every, every fan wants to believe that they know how movies are made. Look, it's the one profession. Every single person in my, in my, everybody thinks they know how to make movies. Everybody. I don't know how to do brain surgery. If I talked to a brain surgeon, I wouldn't be like, you know what you should do? You should cut into a brain like this. Every single person, when you start talking about movies, every single person almost that I've ever had a conversation about, if I go home to Seattle and what do you do? Oh, I work in independent film and I work. Oh, really? Well, you should do this. Every single person has a, a, an opinion about how a movie should get made because everybody watches them. Everybody equates their film fandom to being an expert in knowing how movies are made, how movies are financed, because you can read about these things ad infinitum. But the actual nuts and bolts of making films, unless you've done it, like our young Master Kessler is now finding out, he's learning more about movies. He didn't learn any of this in film school. He's been on set one week, and he's probably learned more about making movies than in the first 20 years of his life. I guarantee you he has. And unless you've made a film, you don't understand how the different pieces all work together. And unless you really understand corporate interests and how corporations work, cor you wish... That's why, and I agree with a lot of what fans say. I've been, I, I, I am a purveyor of, of <laughs> the motion picture business is also the one place where people who are not experts in their field can become wildly successful. 
You know, that's why Kevin Feige and what he's done with the MCU, he is a visionary producer who's kept that boat sailing in the right direction, kept the train on that track. Very few people in Hollywood are like that. As a creative producer, as somebody, there, there's Star Wars needs that. The people that they're hiring are not what we want. What fans want is they want fans that understand the property as they do to head up these things and to run them. And by the way, couldn't agree more. Unfortunately, finding those kinds of people, especially people that, that a studio will trust with hundreds of millions of dollars, there's probably like six people on the planet Earth that'll find those jobs, and Kevin Feige is literally the only one. He's the only one on this entire planet who is in a position where, as a fan, he also cut his teeth working on 13 previous Marvel movies before the MCU started. We need somebody who can run Star Wars that's like that. I'm with you 100%. There isn't one. I don't know if there's anybody in the world that, I mean, Dave Filoni is a good guy, but he's never produced a $200 million movie. You know, and all these other people, like John Favreau is a director. He's a visionary director now. He's become a writer-director. He doesn't want to become somebody who's running the franchise. Kathleen Kennedy is a person that knows how to produce movies for visionary writer-directors, how they work in tandem. The visionary writer-director is going to go make this story. Kathleen Kennedy is like, I know, how to, I know how to facilitate you making that story. But even she needs her visionary people to work with. Visionary people need really strong producers to help them achieve that vision. Because they're too busy trying to figure out how to make that vision. There are very few people like the Kubricks, like the James Camerons, who can do all of those things. It's just, it's a tough world where, where we talk about toxic fandom. It, it, toxic fans, it's about the behavior toward other people that I object to. If you don't like Star Wars, that's one thing. You should be talking about why you don't like Star Wars. What is it about Star Wars that you don't like now? I talk about Star Trek, and it's the same thing. The people that are running Star Trek for the last 10 years, they're, they're trying to make Star Trek its own thing. They're trying to make it what they want it to be. And there's nobody who's, who's trying to keep Star Trek the way it is. That was the one thing under the Berman era. Berman kept Star Trek the way it was. He worked with Roddenberry. Now, rightly or wrongly, he was not a fan. Rick Berman was not a fan. So when you started talking about, what if we brought back these people? Rick Berman's eyes would glaze over. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is I have to make this TV show on time and on budget, you know, and I, I, I need to understand what the stories are. You need to make me understand as a non-fan who's not steeped in all this arcane trivia, how is this script going to work? How is this story going to work for me? And that's what Rick Berman did. He did it for 25 seasons and 18 years of, of, of Star Trek. But there were a lot of people that came on like Ron Moore and then Michael Piller and Robert Hewitt Wolf and, and people like that that were Star Trek fans. They were able to inject some of that back into the series. Well, now we don't have much of that. And the one person you have is not is, is marginalized, Kirsten Beyer, who's an actual Star Trek writer. It's funny because there's the Reeve Stevens are writer producers. They know Star Trek. David Mack. There's a lot of people that should be writing on these shows. Mack is consulting now um, on the animated shows. But anyway, but I, I know what you're saying. I know I've been going on and on and on about this. But but I think the difference between toxic fandom is rather than talking only about the franchises as they know them, toxic fans are going after specific people and fellow fans. And I think that's wrong. You can debate and scream and yell at each other about the thing you love all you want, but when you start going after each other as fans and calling into question who is that person and that person's you know, girl, what does she know? Look, I am wearing a Her Universe t-shirt. It's probably way too small for me. But I love this shirt anyway because, you know, no one's made a Gorn shirt quite like this Her Universe shirt. And I'm sure someone would be like, Her Universe? I mean, what do they know? Why, why did they start a girl's company? I mean, I lived through that era. Anyway, um, I think the fans need to – toxic fandom is, is all about, in my mind, being toxic to each other and to the creators themselves. Remember, the creators themselves, it's not like – J.J. Abrams could do whatever the hell he wants. As powerful as he might be, he's still beholden to his corporate overlords. And, and that's, it's, but anyway, it's, it's something that we all need to, to consider. But again, Mark, you always write great letters. It's something worth talking about. I, I, I've loved the time. I, I love your participation here. And you know, 
I, I give it up to you as well because Mark Mark has said many times he's called himself a toxic fan, and um, he's been nothing but respectful to me and respectful for the channel. And I think it proves that we can be having this kind of dialogue across the internets if we want to, you know, if we want to do that. I think that's that's something that we can do. And and Mark C to me is a shining example of what a toxic fan can be. He's a self-professed toxic fan, but he's certainly not toxic here. We have an ongoing discourse and I've very much appreciated that. And I hope it continues um, because that's the way it can be. Um, Mark C also says, he says, Rob, next time you're in Louisiana, you have to try our homegrown Zaps crawfish flavored potato chips. Uh, you know what? I'm in. I love crawfish. I love Louisiana. Crawfish flavored potato chips. I'm down. Can I order them? Can, I'll have to order that stuff now. Um, CJ Dunn says, <laughs> CJ Dunn says, your commentary on potato chips was hilarious. <laughs> Don't you know what I, I have? I have. I could go on and on about it. mostly junk food. Um, I could give you commentary. You should hear me wax rhapsodic about cinnamon saltwater taffy from Bruce's Candy Kitchen in Cannon Beach, Oregon. It's one of my favorite candies of all time, and I have a pretty uh, geek roof of my mouth. And what I like doing, like I like cinnamon saltwater taffy. It's good. You can like you can go into the Rocky Mountains if you go up into the Rocky Mountains where the hotel that Stephen King stayed at, where the I forget the name of it. But they took me up there when I was at the Fort Collins Comic Con. They have you can get saltwater taffy in like the, this mountain community. It's great up there. I loved it. And cinnamon saltwater taffy is great. I mean, saltwater taffy is great, but it's specifically cinnamon saltwater taffy from Bruce's Candy Kitchen in Cannon Beach, Oregon. Now I've been going there since I was a little kid. My aunt, uh, my aunt used to live there. My aunt and uncle. I don't know what it is, but something about cinnamon saltwater taffy from Bruce's Candy Kitchen. I have this really deep. The roof of my mouth is really deep, so I can actually have four or five pieces of Bruce's cinnamon saltwater taffy, and I get them in my mouth, and I soften them up, and then I push them into the roof of my mouth and sculpt it with my tongue so it just stuck up there, and I can and you know, go like this for like five minutes until it all dissolves. I'm telling you, I could, I could wax rhapsodic about this kind of junk food my whole life, but you know, you guys brought it up. I didn't ask about potato chips, but I'm happy to pontificate about them if that's what you want to say. So I appreciate that, CJ Dunn. You like that commentary. And by the way, you can get Bruce's cinnamon salt water. Bruce's you can get cinnamon saltwater taffy from Bruce's Candy Kitchen. They will mail it to you. And you know, I, I think once in my life I had like a five pound bag of only cinnamon saltwater taffy, and they had to they had to like write me back and go, "Are you sure you just want cinnamon saltwater taffy?" I'm like, "Yes, I just want that." So. A lot of people would accuse me because I love hot tamales. Like, look, I don't like to live my life. This is terrible. but Because it, it now seems like I'm just a junk food fiend. But hot tamales, still my favorite movie candy of all time. I've been eating them. I love cinnamon candy. Red Hots, hot tamales, whatever. And by the way, they have those boxes for 80 cents at the grocery store. So as I get older in life and I don't want to die of a diabetic seizure or something like that, I have to lay off the candy. And And Elizabeth will tell you, I don't have a total sweet tooth. Like, I'm not a fiend for candy all the time. But occasionally, Haribo gummy bears, cinnamon saltwater taffy, hot tamales, red hots, whatever. Haribo gummy bears are not cinnamon, but I love them. They're my favorite. I don't eat American gummy bears. I only eat Haribo gummy bears. Every other gummy bear sucks. They're pretenders. I know. Haribo, German company, Nazis and all. I don't care. Haribo gummy bears are the best. Uh, they, they just are. Anyway, back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto Suarez says, congratulations on reaching 200 episodes. Here's to many more. Well, Roberto, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a member of the Post Geek Singularity community and being an imagination connoisseur. Uh, <laughs> Chuck Philpot says, Grippo's barbecue potato chips. Again, I, I've never had Grippo's barbecue potato chips. I'm perfectly willing to try. <laughs> Draco Eris says, I remember when DVDs started to be a thing, and I swore that I would only buy VHS tapes. I didn't stay true to my word. Well, you know, Draco, we were like that with Laserdiscs. Me and all my buddies were like, you can pry our Laserdiscs from our cold, dead fingers. Well, once I once I understood the technology and I understood progressive scan, and you could see things progressive scan at 24 frames, I was like, wow, this made NTSC video much more palatable. 
And I, I dumped my laser discs. I mean, I didn't really dump them. I still have hundreds of laser discs, but I, I stopped watching them within not very long. It was sad. Travis Rayner says, do you think a movie poster is the best way to promote a film? I think Jaws was probably the best promotional poster ever. Well, it, again, we live in a, the, the movie poster is, first of all, I think a lost art, but unfortunately, uh, the Jaws poster, the main, uh, to give you industry speak, key art, the term key art, that's the main piece of art that is used to promote a movie. That Jaws painting that we saw in the movie poster, that very famous, is obviously one of the great promotional pieces of art ever. There was a lot of great artwork. Star Wars, a lot of great movie poster art really came into its own in the 70s. Um, but the movie poster art used to be hugely important. That was the way you go to the movie theater, they'd, they'd use movie poster art in the newspaper. The, whatever the movie poster was became the sort of singular image that was used to sell a film. That has now changed in the internet era. It's really hard. You can't even, like, when I wanted a movie poster, I could just go to Hollywood Book and Poster or, or, or Cinema Collectors or something in Hollywood Boulevard and just go buy whatever movie poster I wanted. Now you have to go to, like, movieposters.com to get posters. And if you want to go buy an Infinity War one sheet now, they're like 100 bucks. Thor Ragnarok, because they don't make it as many. So uh, I don't know if movie posters are the best way to promote a film. I do still think great key art is because like movie posters of yore, you still need a great image that you can put all over social, social media now because that's where even, even uh, theaters now, like you go to the Arclight, they have some posters, but they've got walls, these electronic walls where they can just program them to show whatever they've got up upcoming. The actual physical poster is no longer that important, but the image still is. It's unfortunate what, what has happened to movie posters. I'm a longtime collector of movie posters. I sold all of my big paper collection to... So your standard movie poster is what's called a one sheet. And a normal one sheet used to be 27 inches by 41 inches. And it had a white border. And then if you took away the border, it was 26 by 40. Now, movie posters, once the, the all movie posters used to come from the same place, a company called the National Screen Service Corporation of America. So if you bought movie posters up through the mostly the mid 80s, there was numbers on movie posters, usually in the bottom right. And there was a little disclaimer, a little paragraph at the bottom in the white of every movie poster in the, in the border that would say, this poster is property of the National Screen Service Corporation. You didn't even own it. When a, when a theater was done with a movie poster, they were supposed to return that poster to the National Screen Service Corporation. And there were regional offices around the United States that had these National Screen Service Corporation offices where they would distribute posters. And they had one sheets, they had inserts, they had lobby cards. They usually, lobby cards were cards, I think they were like four, 11 by 14 or something like that. And they had still frames and a lobby card set was usually eight cards. And when I grew up, I, I collected these things. Now, everybody collected movie posters. When I moved to LA, everybody had one sheets. And when I started collecting posters uh, heavily, uh, you know, I, I started collect, I collected movie posters my whole life, but I started collecting what's called big paper. And starting in, in, well, ending in about 1980, they stopped making big paper. And big paper were variations on the one sheet size. So a one sheet was 27 by 41. So it was 27 by 41 um, tall and then 27 wide. Well, big paper, they had what are called three sheets, which were three one sheets basically stacked on one another. They were 41 by 81. So they were really, really big. And then there were what are called six sheets. And they were 81 by 81. Now, uh, back in the day when I had my office and I was really flush with lots of cash, back in the early, in the mid aughts, early aughts, I mean, from the 19, mid, mid 90s to the, early, the mid aughts, I was buying a lot of big paper. I had a very, I mean, not as much as most. I mean, there's now people that have, anyway. I, I had I had a movie poster collection that was probably, I don't know, about a hundred grand. 
about uh, about a hundred thousand dollars for movie posters. Some of the posters in my collection, I collected specifically mostly three sheets. Most of my, but I collected a lot of foreign posters that were even bigger. Italian four sheets, like for instance, I had an Italian four sheet of the Bicycle Thief, and I also had an Italian four sheet of La Dolce Vita, and um, I sold them both when I needed to pay for what's called an Avid, an editorial piece of editorial equipment. I sold both of those pay posters two of those posters together i should never have sold them but i sold them both for thirty five thousand dollars. Two movie posters uh i don't have nearly that money i'm trying to make rent every year now i'm scraping this was before you know i just become an independent filmmaker back when people had money um and i would sell that stuff to buy more equipment and things like that um and that market, the La Dolce Vita poster sold at auction last year for like $45,000. Not the same poster. But now I could never even afford these posters. But my entire movie poster collection, all of it, they're all framed. I had James Bond three sheets. I had like the Dirty Dozen and the Great Escape. Um, I had the original Mario Bava, the Italian four sheet for Black Sunday. They are all, my entire movie poster collection was purchased because I needed the money was purchased by a company called The Third Floor. And The Third Floor does previs. Whenever you look at the, a Marvel movie, you'll get to a section or any big effects film, Star Wars, any big major effects movie, they all have their previs done by a company called The Third Floor. They actually took over my old offices. Um, they're great. Everybody at The Third Floor is awesome. They do amazing work. If you ever get to The Third Floor, if you're ever working on a project, you can go see my movie poster collection. And it was pretty epic. I mean, if you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror film posters, but nobody cares anymore. You know, now people are more excited about Mondo film posters, and I get it. Um, there are a lot of people that want original movie posters. If you want original movie posters, if you're interested and you want to drop the green on three sheets, there is a place in LA. There's a place called La Magerie, and uh, it, is, it is run by a woman named Debbie. Now, if you are looking for your favorite movie poster and you want to get big paper, you don't want a one sheet. You want to get a three sheet or even a six sheet. I have, for instance, I have six sheets. And, and normally what I would do with these posters, because three sheets and six sheets are in multiple, a lot of the time in multiple parts because they couldn't, they couldn't print them up until the late 70s. They couldn't print them all in one piece of paper because they didn't really have printing presses that were that big. So they were coming, they'd come in two pieces. So what I would do with my big paper was you get them mounted on linen. You get the museum quality mounted on literally a piece of linen and you'd linen back your posters and then you could frame the posters without, I mean, even though they were, they were, they're adhesively, they're glued to the linen. Um, once they're archival mounted, they'll stay, they'll stay uh, valuable, but you can do that. And Debbie will do that for you. And if you call Debbie at La Magerie, tell her that I sent you say, Rob Burnett told me to call and, and that you were the place she's got the best. She can get you anything, any poster in the world that exists now, you'll pay through the nose to get it. You can't, her prices aren't cheap. But if you're looking for your favorite, like if you want a James Bond poster, if you want to get a Thunderball three sheet, it might cost you two or $3,000. And that's a poster that's 41 inches by 81 inches. Robert McGinnis art, whatever. You can get it. She'll find it for you. She has the best poster collection in the world. I'm sure there's other people that do. But when I asked her, I said, hey, can you get me an Italian four sheet of The Bicycle Thief? Or can you get me an Italian four sheet of Mario Bava's Black Sunday? Or the one I regret, half the posters I should never have sold. But I like, I take solace in the fact that I needed the money. Life had taken a downturn for me. I got rid of all my stuff, downsized, got divorced, all that crap, cleaned me out, lawsuits, all that kind of thing. So I don't have a lot of them anymore. But I do have things like a clockwork orange six sheet which is 81 by 81. It's original. What the hell am I going to do with it? Where am I going to put it? I mean, I've got it. It needs to be linen backed. I have a, I have a Soylent Green six sheet. But man, I got rid of, I had New York subway posters for Rollerball and Logan's Run. I had a Zardoz three sheet. James Bond posters. Goldfinger. Uh, um, the only, you know, one of my only posters I collect, I uh, kept actually in The Great Purge. I still have an original, only one sheet, but I have an original perfect Dr. No one sheet hanging right out there. Linen back, love it. I don't know. I'm totally off in the weeds. You asked, Travis. <laughs> Look what you've done, Travis. People, are, it, there's probably no one left in this chat. They're like, what the hell are you talking about? Anyway, let's get back to what you're saying. <laughs> Joseph says, 
Rob, when is the weekly hero coming back? I don't know. You know what? Uh, John put me, he demoted me to three days a week. And I understand we got a great dude dynamic with Aaron and Chris. I really love both Aaron and Chris on the John Campy show, but John was going to make it up to me because you know, that's income. That's income. I, 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 I was demoted. Uh, um, my monthly income took a hit now. So he's got to bring back weekly hero, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I wish he would bring it back. <laughs> uh, let's see. I've got another letter because I got lots of letters. Um, let's see, here we go. This one comes from Ian Samuels. <laughs> this is a good one. Ian Samuels. Again, this is a complete change of 180. Rob Meister general Hollywood needs to learn to leave Japanese horror alone. The Japanese know what they are doing and have made some of the finest horror films of all time. I'm a hammer horror fan. And when I first came across Japanese horror, I got an education damn is Japanese horror good and damn scary but classics such as the Ringu series Jew on the Grudge Dark, Dark Water One Miss Call my beloved Pulse and Apartment 1303 have suffered the ignominy of American remakes each and every one of the American remakes are terrible and do not live up to the greatest the horror and the scariness of the Japanese originals although I will say this I think Gore Verbinski's American remake of Ringu, The Ring, was pretty damn good. So this is my message to Hollywood and to anyone else out there who even considers remaking a Japanese horror film. Leave it alone. The Japanese know what they're doing, and you making your horrible remakes dilutes the greatness of the originals. You cannot do it justice, so leave it alone. Well, Ian, you know what? I, I tend to agree. One of my favorite modern uh, Japanese horror films, and I've talked about this on the show a lot, is Kyushu Kurosawa's Pulse. I love that movie so much. Came out in the early aughts. Uh, if you haven't seen Pulse, don't watch the American remakes, even though Kristen Bell's, just don't. Don't. Watch the original. It is great existential dread horror, and I love it. But look, you know, I think part of the reason, like, I would say that one of the things I loved about J-horror uh, is there's is that Asian culture is different than our culture. And I think what's really, what's very interesting is one of the reasons I love Pulse, I don't think an American or a European would have ever come up with the idea of Pulse on their own. You know, I, I think one of the one of the neat things about, well, Asian cinema in general, it's the difference in culture that makes it so, so I think interesting from my perspective, the things that make uh, the Japanese audiences scared are different than what make our audiences scared. You know, again, I've said it before, the, the whole idea of a, we are basically a Judeo-Christian nation. Asian uh, countries are, are different than that. They don't have the kind of religious tradition that we have, and the way they look at the afterlife is different. And the fact that, you know, <laughs> the fact that your ancestors are still looking down on you and they're not as forgiving, <laughs> but Asian culture is different. And that's one of the, I think the cool things about Asian horror is the, the concerns of Asian horror. Like, yeah, okay. So there's ghosts and things like that, but it's different. You know, it's, it's a different thing. And, and that's one of the great things about Japanese and let's not forget Chinese and Koreans, man, the Koreans have been knocking it out of the park uh, when it comes to horror films, man. I love, I mean, you know, the the uh, uh, Train to Busan is one of the great zombie movies of all time. And and I thought, just when I thought I was zombied out, along came Train to Busan, which has both zombies and melodrama. You know, I loved it. And, and I think that's one of the great things. If you're not watching movies from around the world, you're doing yourself a disservice. If you haven't seen Kingdom, uh, the, the Korean TV series, the zombie period piece, you you got to you got to see this stuff. You got you you owe it to yourself if you're a horror fan. There are some great there's there's some Mexican horror films that are insane. Some really crazy hardcore stuff that you've probably never heard of. But I'm telling you, there's we have to all of us. I implore all of you, all of you imagination connoisseurs, keep an open mind. You know, if you like Tarantino movies, there's a Japanese film called The World of Conico. If I'm not pronouncing your last name right or her name first name. If you haven't seen the world of Conoco and you like Quentin Tarantino movies or just crime thrillers or mysteries, watch that. 
it's pretty good. <laughs> but I would implore all of you imagination connoisseurs to, to put some foreign films in your diet. But I think you're right. Uh, I really do agree, Ian, that uh, we... The reason that Japanese horror especially I don't think translates as well as it could is because of the unique nature of Japanese culture that is imbued in these films. And we are Americans just kind of get it superficially. But I'm Pulse to me, the, the, the remake of Pulse compared to the original Japanese version is, is a case in point. Um, I think the entire existential dread is absent from the American remake. And and I, I dearly love that movie. If you guys haven't seen Pulse, check it out. Uh, this one's pretty good. This is a quick one. This this comes from Christy Cobb. I don't know, Christy. I don't I don't think you've written in before, but Christy wrote me a letter and I appreciate it. I'm I'm happy to read it today because she took my advice for better or for worse. <laughs> Rob, regarding movies that I have never seen up until yesterday, that one for me was Apocalypse Now. Every one of my generation this movie came out when I was in junior college, has seen and praised it. Well, on your recommendation, don't worry, I don't blame you. I'm responsible for my own choices. I went to see the re-release in our IMAX theater. Mercy, more horrific than Saving Private Ryan. I can't deny the art of the work, but I had to close my eyes and the things I de did see, but Jiminy, I won't be able to unsee. I have learned once again, that I need to listen to my heart when deciding what to watch. Love your show, Rob. You're awesome. Christy C. Well, Christy, first of all, I didn't mean for you to see something that you didn't want to see or that was at all uncomfortable for you. Um, I think Apocalypse Now is a stunning achievement, both as an adaptation of Heart of Darkness and also as a, as a war film and also as a story about the human experience the darkness that's in the human heart, but it is not necessarily an easy movie to watch. And I think it is a it is a reminder about the power of cinema because one of the great things about Apocalypse Now is, yeah, it had a troubled production history. And and if you watch, I I would uh, hope everybody will buy the for for those of you who don't know this weekend playing right now today at your local IMAX theater is Apocalypse Now. Final Cut. Not the Final Cut, it's just Apocalypse Now, Final Cut. And remember, Christy, the movie is called Apocalypse Now. So, you know, Saving Private Ryan is a far more traditional narrative. I think one of the things about Apocalypse Now is it's a fever dream, literally about a descent into hell, if you want to look at it that way. You know, you're not going up the Nung River, you're going up the River Styx. And, and I don't know which circle of hell Kurtz's camp is, is on the on the banks of or or what part of, of the river sticks it, it definitely has a hellish as aspect to it but you know i i think in my mind first of all apocalypse now feels very very real it's it's you are there and it's so brilliantly photographed in the new sound design but it's coming out there's a six disc set coming out with both the new version of final cut is an amalgamation of the original theatrical version of apocalypse now and apocalypse now redux and Coppola has gone in and put together what he calls his definitive version of the movie, which is Final Cut. They all come out at the end of this month on 4K disc, and they all include the Blu-rays. If you haven't seen Apocalypse Now, it's an, an incredible film. You can't really see it, but I have a gigantic Japanese Apocalypse Now poster hanging right in front of me that I look at and inspires me every day. But Christy, I want to thank you for going to see it. You know, I, I think that even though there might be images that were rough and that you might not soon forget, I think Apocalypse Now is going to give you food for thought uh, for a long time to come. And it's certainly a movie like something you would never see today. I don't think Apocalypse Now will ever get made today. I don't think they even know how. I don't think you can get insurance to make a movie uh, the way. It would just be all green screen and, and the helicopter attack on the beach. Remember, you're not watching any CG when you watch that movie. It was all done real. But I want to thank you for going. I appreciate that. I, 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 I'm always an advocate of, of people seeing movies rather than not seeing them. And I, I'm sorry that it was a rough experience for you. But thank you for going. And thanks for writing in and telling me that you went. Because uh, I love that. 
Uh, I love that. I love hearing from people. And uh, definitely, uh, thank you for writing in. It's funny. I'd love to. I'd love for you to maybe write in and tell me what you thought about it. Um, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, Timbula the Spider Monkey writes in. Here's to 200 episodes, Rob. Glad to have come along for the ride. Congratulations on building such a vibrant, engaging, and respectful community. Well, Timbula, I want to thank you because you've written in a number of letters. You've always been supporting the channel. And, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about the journey that you've taken with your significant other. And uh, it's great. All the way from Australia. Love that. You know, I miss Cooper's. I wish I, 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 I miss drinking Cooper's on tap. Some uh, more of the vintage Penfolds wines. I'd love to get to Australia again. Love to go work on a project there. Uh, that would be most excellent. So thanks for being here. Thanks for supporting and your ongoing support of the channel. Very generous. Thank you so much. Katie uh, German is here. 200 episodes. Well done, Rob, and congratulations. Looking forward to the next 200 and beyond. Well, thank you, Katie. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being a member of the Post Geek Singularity community. Thanks for being an imagination connoisseur. Anthony Gonzalez says, now that you own Endgame, uh, could you, with your physical media, show us your MCU ranking? <laughs> like stack them up? <laughs> I could do that. Um, I could stack them up. You know, it's funny. I, 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 that's interesting. You know, I need to go back and, and consider. It's funny. Elizabeth and I, we were doing, I was going to do a rewatch of all the MCU movies leading up to Endgame. We didn't really do it, but we did watch Iron Man. I hadn't seen Iron Man in a long time. And first of all, I love Iron Man 1, but I was surprised at what an intimate film it is. You know, compared to where the MCU went, you watch Iron Man and it really is, it really is Robert Downey Jr.'s film. And even the battle at the end is just two guys vying over the soul of a company. Really interesting. But that's funny. I'll do that. I can't do it right now. I'd have to like get up. And I know it's, otherwise I just run and get my, my physical media and, and show it to you, but I'd have to really contemplate. It's weird. I, I don't know if I could do that. I don't, don't know if I could make a whole ranking. Willow, yeah, <laughs> Willow is here. Willow says, when you get Slurpees, do you like to mix every single flavor together? That's what I always do. No, I do not. I am a, I have a, I'm a man of simple tastes. I am a purist. I am a Slurpee. I understand why people mix it all together. I do. And I don't begrudge that. I see that all the time. No, I'm 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 a cola slurpee guy. I love cola slurpees. I really do. I think they're great. Uh, Stubble McShave says, "I'm happy we have a passionate fan and experienced writer producer as a showrunner for the Wheel of Time series rather than a guy collecting a check." Well, one of the great things we like about Stubble McShave all the way over in Europe that he is in Sweden is how much he loves. Mr. Jordan's Wheel of Time series. No one is more excited. I feel that Stubble McShave's excitement about this Wheel of Time series, it, 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 it makes me giddy with anticipation, if only because I can't wait to read his review, either pro or con. I think it's going to be con. But uh, no, I, I mean, I think it's going to be pro. What, are, what am I saying? I think I think Stubble, if, if nothing else, Stubble is, the energy coming off of him is going to will this show to be good. So, so Stubble... Um, I, I do too. I like experienced showrunners, and clearly it sounds like the people involved love the Wheel of Time series. I hope it's great, if only for your sake. You know, it's going to be one of those things where I'm going to be watching this show very carefully. I know I'm going to have to watch it as soon as it's available. I can't wait like a couple days because I need to be right there with you when you're going to write me and tell me what you're going to think about the show. And I better, because if I don't watch it, it'll be bad. It'll be bad. Greg Smith is here. My my Our moderator writes me in. Greg Smith... Greg Smith is sending me a super chat. Greg Smith says, congratulations, Rob, on 200. If there's a dark spot in the universe, your channel is furthest from it. Your chat subscribers share credit for that. Well, Greg, and so do you, keeping the chat subscribers uh, honest. But yes, thank you so much, my friend. Um, it's great to have you here. And for those of you who want to meet Greg uh, and see what he looks like and what he sounds like, I did drop three videos over the last two days. Uh, middle-aged cosplay, and then a video about his land speeder that he built, and you really get a sense of his genteel personality and what a great a great man Greg Smith has grown up into. He's also a great father and a great husband, and he has goats, people. Greg Smith has goats. It's true. Not only did he build his house that he lives in, he also milks goats, and, and he can fix a car. There's nothing Greg Smith can't do. 
And uh, thank you for that, Greg. I appreciate that. Timula the Spider Monkey also says, Deathstalker 1 and 2 are on Prime. Hmm. Well, my friend, I think a Deathstalker marathon is in your future. Uh, Liam in Japan says, Rob, if you visit Japan, we'll have beers, wasabi, potato chips, and congrats on the 200th. Any thoughts on the just announced Masters of the Universe anime? No, I don't know. I didn't know there was a Masters of the Universe anime. Look, I would love to see a He-Man show that isn't so concerned with children and, and, and giving them good lessons to learn. I'd love to see an anime style He-Man show that really gets into it. You know, kind of like what Berserk or something like that. Um, that would be cool. I would love that. Um, oh, uh, uh, Travis Rayner says, do you like any black exploitation films? A lot of people don't know these films saved Hollywood back in the 70s. Superfly and The Mac are my favorites. Superfly and The Mac are great. Of course, I like Shaft. I love Slaughter. Uh, Larry Cohen's Black Caesar. Uh, Coffee, Foxy Brown. You know, I, I was a big fan of black exploitation movies. And uh, I can't wait to see Dolomite Is My Name. So I think, I, I think with the Dolomite Is My Name film, I mean, we've had, it's interesting, um, you know, we had original gangsters. I talk about that. Larry Cohen came back to the genre in the in the '90s. But I think that, and of course, Rudy Rudy Ray Moore, Dolomite, the the those films have always been around. A lot of rappers have have obviously gone back. The Superfly remake that came out last year. I think black exploitation movies have been with us certainly in the last twenty years. But I I enjoy going back and watching them. They're fun. They're look a lot of them are there. They can be a slog to sit through. But I, it's all about who, who, who's in the, you know, Pam Greer, Richard Roundtree, Fred Williamson. I mean, all these guys are, are, and girls are great to watch. And I really, it's a part of our history, man. I really enjoy black exploitation movies. I, I think they're a lot of fun. And the Mac, the Mac and Superfly are, are certainly great, certainly great, good ones. But yeah, I do. I'm a big fan. I grew up watching those movies and I, I love them. And I think if Dolomite is my name becomes huge, I mean, it looks so good, so good that maybe I'd love to see them all remastered. And somebody's got to do like a great big box set. I don't know what the rights are like, but I'm sure it's a nightmare trying to figure it out. Stubble McShave says Terrence Malick's new film looks really good. Uh, it really does. Fox Searchlight is putting out Terrence Malick's new movie. And Fox, uh, the, the Terrence Malick's new film is about, uh, about a Russian, a Russian, uh, a German dissenter who did not want to fight in the war. And it's about how he resists. Uh, let's see. And let me get this correct. I want to I look it up. And it's called A Hidden Life. A Hidden Life. And uh, it's based on a true story. It looks amazing. And I will say, you know, Terrence Malick has been really hit and miss like night of cups i was really looking forward to and uh, it was kind of a slog i loved the new version of tree of life that criterion put out i'm a huge fan of the new world i loved the new world and of course a hidden life is new film that's coming out from fox searchlight looks amazing it really looks amazing so uh yes yes double i agree with you uh this one this is i really like this letter again this should start some uh, some uh, controversy in the in the live chat here. Uh, this one comes from Crosstalk again. Crosstalk's been writing us a few times lately. Crosstalk says, hello again, Rob, from up here in Edmonton. I'd overheard this discussion the other day, and for some reason it seemed to stick with me. There were two girls talking about Louis C.K. and Johnny Depp and about their various interpersonal problems. Louis C.K. with his assault allegations and Depp with his domestic abuse allegations. Both of these girls, I guess their age somewhere in the early to mid-20s, although I honestly have no idea these days, agreed they retroactively disliked everything these guys had contributed in the pop culture sphere. I have no problem with revisiting things we previously liked and reevaluating those things based on who we are now. As an example... I loved the A-Team, Airwolf, Knight Rider, and the Black Hole as a kid. But revisiting these as an adult, admittedly, I only watched about five episodes of the A-Team and only two of Airwolf before I had to stop, 
made me realize just how my tastes on what is good differs now. That makes sense in a lot of ways to me. In the 80s, there wasn't a lot of choice on TV for programs that appealed to someone like me who loved comics and sci-fi, so there was some slim pickings. Seeing them now, I might class them as guilty pleasures at best, and what the hell am I watching at worst? However, my experience with revisiting these shows is purely based on the material at hand. I know that, historically, David Hasselhoff is kind of a hot mess, but that doesn't make me dislike Star Crash as a blast to watch kind of in the same vein as the more trendy The Room is to many. Roman Polanski famously abused multiple teens during his tenure in Hollywood. I think only one. As I'm sure behind closed doors is much more common than people thought, some of which has slowly come to light now, and then of course fled the country to avoid the consequences of his actions. Does that mean The Pianist is any less of a great movie? Does the knowledge that Johnny Depp has some deep interpersonal issues make me love Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas any less? Does the knowledge that Kevin Spacey's, although I read his charges were dropped now, I think, alleged multiple abuses make me love the usual suspects any less? Come to think of it, Brian Singer has some pretty nasty allegations dropped about him as well. Hmm, something in the catered food during that movie shoot? In any case, no. I can still love these things, even if these people are evidenced to be what we would call highly problematic is the nicest term that comes to mind. To me, it's kind of a baby meets the bathwater scenario. Look, everyone is entitled to their way of consuming the entertainment they enjoy. But to discount everything someone does based on the personal issues of anyone, to me, is removing a significant source of material which, with, with which to incorporate into our growth as a citizen of this amazing planet. I'm not saying that we need to incorporate ideas or habits from people that we dislike or even outright hate, but take the information given as its own beast. A lot of times people discount ideas from people simply because they don't like them or their ideas. I might not agree with a lot of what Karl Marx says, but he makes a lot of valid critiques on capitalist behavior. The same is true of Ayn Rand, my intention was not to get political here, but I'm trying to voice a concern I see of retroactive hatred being leveled against pieces of media, in this case, after the fact. I do love that I still live in a country where people are free to do that if they wish, but I think that as the mass media and social media of today drives a wedge further between us and polarizes us into predetermined boxes where we can neatly classify people, this is going to become more rampant. Humans are complicated creatures, and we have, complement, we have complicated relationships with the world around us. Hell, humans pair bond with inanimate objects as sentimental value, for crying out loud, myself included. To discount the value that someone can bring into our lives based on their personal problems is a shame. I hope we grow past this. I know some may not agree with me on this, but it was a thought that kind of bothered me for the last couple of days, and I figured I'd see what you'd think of this phenomenon I encountered. And also, if you have experienced anything like this as well, Rob, since you are closer to the source of pop culture of the pop culture vortex that is Hollywood than I am. Anyway, my rant is over, Rob. Much love to all the post geek singularity community for myself and the great white nor north. Take off, hosers. Crosstalk. Well, crosstalk, a great letter. You know, I think it's it's one of those issues of the modern day. Do we uh, do we take everything that problematic artists are involved with and throw them out? I, I have a simple answer to that, and I'll tell you. I, I say no. I say no. We don't, especially when you're working on movies. Now, we have heard a lot, and there's no doubt that say one of the great directors who ever lived, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, loved beautiful blondes. He gave us, of course, Grace Kelly in Rear Window. Uh, one of my favorite female characters. Like if, if when I say I love Grace Kelly, I love. I mean, Grace Kelly is a beautiful woman, but I don't. I don't fantasize about Grace Kelly the woman, or meeting her, or hanging out with her, or doing anything, you know, else with her. I tend to fall in love with actresses based on characters they played. Like I don't. I don't love the actress. I love the character in the film. So when I think about Grace Kelly's character 
in Rear Window. I'm thinking about that fictional character. I love that fictional character. I love that she's obviously one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life in that particular film. But I also love her character traits. She's very strong. Like when she comes over to Jimmy, she loves Jimmy Stewart. She waits on him hand and foot, uh, even though a woman like that doesn't have to wait on anyone. But one of the things I also loved about her was uh, she packed a, a bag, a small bag, her overnight bag with everything she needed with military precision. I love the character. Now, a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I love the character that Sharon Stone plays in Basic Instinct. She's a psychopathic, manipulating killer, but I loved her character. I mean, she's astonishingly beautiful, of course, but I loved her character in that movie. Yes, she's a dangerous predator that likes to manipulate people, but there's something about her character I find irresistible. Now, she's a bad woman. <laughs> I love that movie. Nick Curran, the character that Michael Douglas plays, he's doomed. Basically, as, as Paul Verhoeven said, Sharon Stone is playing the devil in Basic Instinct. And if you think of it like that, I mean, she doesn't really know. I mean, maybe she does. But if you think about that, that Nick Curran, you know, he's the hero of this movie. He's so in over his head <laughs> the whole time. I love it. I, I, I love it. But when it comes to problematic people in real life, I tend to look at it this way. I know from my own experience when I'm editing, say, Tango Shalom, and I'm sitting here working with uh, my director, whatever my other proclivities in life may be, whatever if I have problematic behaviors in other aspects of my life, when I'm working on, ta as long as they're not my filmmaking, when I'm working on Tango Shalom, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm thinking about, okay, this movie, Every all of my attention is focused on this movie. I am not I, I, I'm only thinking on the film, about the film. So while I'm working on Tango Shalom, I'm not thinking about my favorite food. I'm not thinking about physical media. I'm not thinking about comic books. I'm thinking about nothing other than making Tango Shalom the best it can be. Now, let's say I turned out to be a horrible murderer. I found out, I don't know, I, I, somebody, somebody pissed me off. I was in a fight. I turned, I, I turned into a rage monster which I've, I've done. I've turned into a rage monster and I've done something problematic. Now, whatever set me off or whatever has nothing to do with the work that I was doing on Tango Shalom. When I was working on Tango Shalom, you know, that, that, that work, that's all I was thinking about. Now, if I killed somebody in a fit of rage, like that incident I talked about yesterday on my show, if I was at a classical music concert, somebody stepped up to me because they were rude and I, we had words and I got into a fight and I accidentally threw somebody down the steps at the Hollywood Bowl and um, it, I was shown as being going off in a rage and killing somebody. What does that have to do with the work that I was doing on Tango Shalom? Tango Shalom might be forever tainted because people would say that Rob Burnett, he has a bad temper and he killed somebody in a fight. Well, I assure you, when I was working on Tango Shalom, the movie, and I was working on, I was doing my part, which is editing, producing, and post-supervising this film, that the incident that happened at the Hollywood Bowl where I killed somebody has no bearing at all on the film Tango Shalom. It certainly doesn't have any bearing on all the talented other people, such as director Gabe Bologna or his father, Joseph Bologna, who's in the film and also co-wrote the film has no bearing on the movie at all. And yet, something that happens when I, I got angry and lost control and killed... By the way, I didn't get angry and lose control at the Hollywood Bowl. I didn't get into a fight with anybody, but assuming I'm just using this as an example. In this example, I did. I lost control and murdered somebody. Well, I would hate it if the three, actually now the four years of work that was done on Tango Shalom, how we, everybody has worked so hard and continues to work hard on this, this independent movie. It has this work and the movie itself, nothing about this movie has anything to do with me losing control and murdering somebody by accident. It was manslaughter, but getting into a fight at the Hollywood bowl. And yet when Tango Shalom comes out, the only thing anybody would talk about is the fact that one of the producers who also edited and post supervised the film killed somebody because he lost control, couldn't handle it. Well, I think one thing has nothing to do with the other. I think anybody that works on, in this case, you asked about movies. 
if people are problematic in their private life, I do not necessarily think that you should stop watching films, which is the product of hundreds of people's work. You should stop watching films because they've done something problematic. I don't think that takes away from the power of the movie because people are interesting, they're infinitely complex, and people compartmentalize their lives. You shouldn't be judged you know, your your work as an artist, I mean, I'm not saying it's not, I mean, sure, if, if I had this boiling anger in me, maybe my boiling anger can be seen in what I'd like to say is an indie Jewish spiritual quest family dance comedy fable, because that's what Tango Shalom is. I would hope that you would be able to see my anger in the film. I don't have anger, but I'm just, I'm going with my, my I mean, I have anger about some things, but I don't, I don't have the kind of anger that's going to lead me to pop off and get into a fight where I'm going to murder somebody at the Hollywood Bowl. But in this case, I'm just using it as an example. I just think you can't, people are multifaceted. And if somebody's done great work over the years that you've enjoyed, like, I mean, I love Usual Suspects. I love Kevin Spacey as Jack Vincennes in LA Confidential. When I'm watching LA Confidential, I love Kevin Spacey's character. I love his performance. I don't stop in the middle and go, I can't watch this movie anymore. Because when I'm watching a film, I believe in the verisimilitude of what I'm watching. So I don't think to myself, ooh, that person in real life. Or I don't watch a Hitchcock movie and go, that poor man was trapped in his body. No one is ever going to say he was a Laflario that all women wanted to hook up with. The poor man was, a, I, I, I look at Alfred Hitchcock as a dude, and I think, my God, that man was tormented in life because of he never was able to, to, to I mean, appar apparently he was married and celibate for 50 years. You know, I don't know what, what that was all about, but I, I can only imagine, you know, not being the great beauty that he was, he was never to have, I mean, Alfred Hitchcock fantasized about his, his hot blondes that he could never have and made movies about them instead. Now, in a way, I feel his torment and I, and I, I feel bad for him, but I'm not going to not watch Vertigo because it, it's, you know, it has a lot to do with his own psyche. So I, I, I think watching, in my mind, I divorce myself from what somebody has done. Look, I like comedians, but I've met a lot of comedians and they have very, very dark, sometimes very dark lives. And, and comics have a lot of, of I, I think Bill Cosby being the greatest. I mean, I grew up w example of this. I mean, Bill Cosby had a certain uh, sexual predilection. He was a predator. I mean, he he drugged and raped women. He he was a a serial predator, and he uh, uh, he masked that by pretending he was America's father. And I think at the end of the day, a person like Bill Cosby, I'm a lot less forgiving because he was using his position of power and and to help him become a predator. In the case of Roman Polanski. He is not a serial rapist. Um, I mean, again, that's why we have differing crimes. I mean, you first degree, second degree, third degree, manslaughter, different kinds. There's, there's different, you know, um, people who are monsters are monsters. And, and the more monstrous, the harder it is to watch them again. A guy like Bill Cosby, I find far more problematic because I feel like his entire life was based around feeding his um, desires. And Kevin Spacey is a man that obviously was never comfortable with his sexuality. So I feel sympathy for him. And he was in the closet. And I think he did damage to his own himself and his community. The, the gay community could have been greatly helped if Kevin Spacey was honest with himself. But people are complex and, and they do bad things. But I, I'd like to think that I... Um, it really depends, I guess. I can It depends on the person. I can't say, but for me personally, I'm able to disassociate myself up to a point, up to a point. But I think it's problematic, and it's something that is not does not have any easy answers. But I will say this: there are thing. One of the things that really bothers me is we do have a criminal justice system. It's one of the things that separates the United States out. I believe in our criminal justice system, and I think if you are uh, convicted by a jury of your peers and you do your time, 
when you come out, you have to be allowed to have that fresh start. I know it's really difficult for people to do that, but our justice system works at, well. It works the way it works because we all believe in it. And uh, you are innocent until proven guilty. And I think one of the things that does scare me about the modern age is we are very quick now in the social media space to pillory people right away because we want to believe or we're quick to believe the worst. It's more fun to believe the worst. It's more fun to get angry and outraged than it is to stop and go, hey, yo, put on the brakes, man. We need to see, we need to make sure that these allegations are true. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't believe victims. That's not what I'm saying. But I am just saying that our, our legal system, is, our legal system is one of the cornerstones of our civilization, at least in America. And we need to support that as well. Um, but again, problematic question. It's tough, man. It is tough. Again, I don't, I don't dislike Miramax movies, but Harvey Weinstein's a piece of shit. Harvey Weinstein used his success as a great producer to further his abuse of people. And uh, that that's something... However, I'll, I don't not watch a Miramax movie because Harvey Weinstein was a producer on it. I'm not going to do that. What did, Harvey Weinstein is not going to curtail my uh, enjoyment of, say, Pulp Fiction... Harvey Weinstein was a piece of shit, no doubt. But it's a, it's a difficult question, man. And it's a question I think that we should always continue to address and ask ourselves. And it's a question that we should... These difficult issues are not issues that we should just decide. These are things that should be carefully considered and reconsidered over and over and over again. And I don't know if there's any easy answers. But I do think that, um, that it's a great question you bring up. And it's something that we're never going to stop talking about. And uh, I do really appreciate you writing in uh, Crosstalk because I think that is a, it's again, it's tough. What do you think, Gilbert? Huh? You guys are being good. They're being good. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Dieter Bastian. <laughs> Dieter Bastian says, Rob, have you seen the clip from Endgame where Tony's snap is underscored with Black Sabbath's Iron Man? What an awesome idea, and it works wonders. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, as soon as I see that, uh, I saw that drop, somebody put the Iron Man music uh, to the, the, the Black Sabbath Iron Man piece of music that they used to promote Iron Man 1, of course. Um, was they they used some of it over the scene in Endgame where Tony Stark snaps? As soon as that I saw that, I retweeted it. I put it everywhere. I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was awesome. Loved it. So yes, I did. Yes, Dieter, I did, and it was great. Just plain Steve says Ian telling Hollywood not to remake J horror films is pretty narrow minded. They may be largely bad, but they also may set people on a path to discover foreign films they wouldn't otherwise have. Well, just plain Steve, good point. That's a good point. But I think I think that more of what Ian was saying is, is that so often there is a there is something about those films. The essence doesn't survive translation. And I think, look, I think sometimes the ring, most people didn't never Americans had never heard of Ringu before. They're like, the ring is a remake? No. There are people that went and saw the remake of The Ring with Naomi Watts that was directed by Gore Verbinski. I love that remake. I thought it was great. And a lot of people discovered J-Horror because of that. So I agree. I agree with what you're saying. But I think, you know, the first time somebody wants to remake something, they want to change it. You know, I I, I love to make things and, and, and give it. Look, Magnificent Seven being a version of Seven Samurai. Of course, the Man with No Name trilogy for a few dollars more and a fistful of dollars. You know, Jimbo, Sanjuro, you know, remakes of those. Well, you know, Jimbo. I, I think that remakes can be can be a great thing. And, and it's it, the first thing you, when you hear about a remake and you know it's a remake is where did the original come from? So I agree with you. I think that it's, I don't think he's being narrow minded though. I think what Ian is saying is that, uh, I mean, he's saying don't remake them, but I think his point on a larger, to a large extent, is if you're going to remake stuff, you got to know what it is you're remaking. Why do you love these things? And a lot of the time, uh, I think it's ill considered, especially when you're cross going uh, cross cultural remakes are even harder. 
I mean, hell, there's a samurai, there's a Japanese remake of Unforgiven that's pretty good. You know, you got to check that out. Really interesting. I thought it was really good. Um, I think in samurai movies and westerns, of course, there's a lot of cross promotion between them. But I, you know, I understand what you're saying about being narrow minded. But I think what what Ian was speaking about is people that are making these remakes and they don't quite understand. Like I think when you're trying to remake Asian horror and bring it to America, one of the great things about Asian horror is its Asian origins. The fact that it's steeped in Asian culture, which there's just cultural touchstones that are different than ours. And and like our our idea of what ghosts are are different. And the first thing people do when they were remaking J horror over here was start to change the very essence of what what it was all about. You see that especially in the Pulse remake. I mean the the Pulse the original Pulse movie Kurosawa's film, not Akira Kurosawa's, but Kyushu Kurosawa's movie, you know, just had an existential dread to it that I'm sure was the first thing that they just wrote out of the American remake. It's it's a bummer. Um, Hapkido Lock, Hapkido Lock says, happy 200th, Rob, and thank you. Well, thank you for supporting the channel. I very much appreciate that. Um, <laughs> thanks i really do appreciate the support and you know what apparently gilbert appreciates the support as well gilbert only barks like that when someone's coming in the door and with two teenage girls well, actually no no longer a teenager because she's going to be 19 zoe trope almost being 19 and, and sophie by the way sophie sophie who uh everyone likes sophie who many of you met sophie started her first job yesterday believe it or not. And Sophie's first job, very cool for her. She's 16. She is working at the LA Zoo. She's working in the gift shop at the LA Zoo. So if you live in Los Angeles and you go to the LA Zoo, I guess she'll be working on the weekends. I don't know if she's only working Saturdays or what, but if you go to the LA Zoo and you go to the gift shop, ask for Sophie and then go find her manager and supervisor and tell everyone how great she is. So Congratulations to Sophie for her first day of her first job ever. She's working a cash register, so congratulations to Sophie for her first job. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so CJ Dunn says, Rob, shoe on the other foot, walk a mile in another shoes. Willow Yang, bend the knee, hashtag we love you, Willow, and hashtag this one's for you. Well, thank you, CJ. Uh, you know, one day, one day, I think, if nothing else, Willow's going to wake up and find out she's a diabetic because of all the sweetness we bestow upon her here. She's going into anaphylactic shock or something like that. Ooh, this is a good letter. One of my favorite letter writers, the lovely, lovely M.E. Uh, M.E. is here with another letter. Uh, truly a beautiful woman and a very smart lady. And uh, I would like to read this. This is a great letter. This comes from M.E., Another one of our great letter writers. Greetings, Rob. I hope you're having a lovely weekend. I've been pondering a subject recently. Anyone can have an opinion and hold to it strongly, especially when those they choose to surround themselves with agree with that opinion. Still, the amusing things about opinion that many who hold them sacred forget is, regardless of agreement or lack thereof, they're just that opinions. The depth of one's belief in them doesn't make them any more or any less factual. They're relevant to those who hold them, but many others will likely disagree for a multitude of reasons. Why is this? Because primarily, while not always the case, opinions are not built on anything that can be held to be substantive. 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 Opinions are not, in their essence, based on details that are irrefutable. <laughs> That's why I love Emmy. <laughs> One day I hope we can hang out. Before Star Trek Discovery began airing, an oppressively loud segment of Trekkies proclaimed that this new direction of Star Trek is a, quote, massive failure. This segment has continued their proclamations. Oh. Now I'm guilty. Even as demonstrable evidence has mounted that not only shows their claims to be fabrications, but silly. I would be embarrassed if I had willfully chosen to go along on such an unwarranted ride and then stayed on it well after I knew it was bollocks. 
but not those brewing and sipping on this particular blend of rhetoric. <laughs> Instead, uh oh, I need to take a drink for that. <laughs> Instead of coming to their senses and realizing that despite the current group of Star Trek creators no longer providing fare that appeals to their preferences, and them then moving on to other forms of entertainment that do, they have hunkered down in their bunkers and continued to forcefully <laughs> lob unfounded argumentative grenades on any social and entertainment platform available to them. This is where I hang my head in shame, Emmy. <laughs> they hold tightly to the belief that this current Star Trek is a failure, and not just a mere failure, an unmitigated one. It's a failure, they claim, despite CBS All Access growing by leaps and bounds once it launched with Star Trek Discovery. It's failing despite us now witnessing the nascent beginnings of a Star Trek universe, one which is likely the driving force behind the reconstruction of a Fisher Corporation, and no, Star Trek's universe does not have to measure up in scope nor financial success to the MCU's to be a success for its parent company. Consequently, I've been sitting back and pondering, what will it take for this particular uh, and peculiar segment of Trekkie fandom to discontinue their unfounded protestations? It makes no logical sense that they've continued to believe the things they do and that's even more baffling coming from people who are supposedly Star Trek fans. They should be far more prone to rational thinking than any other fandom, and yet they continue to hold fast to anecdotal evidence that keeps being ripped to shreds by conflicting evidence, evidence which is factually sound. People can proclaim that they detest the new direction CBS is taking Star Trek. They can emphatically state that they hope with all of their might that this endeavor fails because they wholeheartedly believe it should. They can even maintain that what's being given to them now doesn't measure up, in their opinion, to what came before. And that's not what they want Star Trek to be. People can love and hate something for any reason, and there's nothing anyone can nor should attempt to do about it, unless those partialities lead to the potential or actual harm of others. It is nonsensical, though, to take a dislike <laughs> or a love and twist evidence to fit neatly into one's preferred version of reality. I speculate that what's currently occurring between CBS and Viacom is the aftermath of a successful business gamble on CBS's side. I don't know this to be true, but considering how companies operate, especially when their endeavors are meeting with success, I hold there's a high probability that my speculation is closer to the truth than not. The actions of CBS and Viacom demonstrate that this iteration of Star Trek is a financial success, despite the high costs of each episode of Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard. It is also a franchise success, especially because the fandom has not only held, but likely grown. I am going to attempt to lay this out as succinctly as I can from a business's P&L profit and loss perspective. The numbers used below are hypothetical and not meant to reflect CBS's actual monetary and clientele growth. I don't know these numbers, but I know business. If I set my business plan around the launching of a new product and determine beforehand that I will not only make a profit of 25% once my new product launches, I will also grow my existing client base by 7 to 10%. Then my undertaking is a success. Whether I spend $100 million combined to make and market the product, and then I had sales of $125 million, or spent $60 million and saw, saw sales of $75 million. The result of both scenarios is a profit margin of 25%, regardless of costs. Also, if I started with a client base of 600000 and added 42,000 once I launched my product with no discernible loss of the 600,000 base that I began with, then that's a gain of 7% and it fits perfectly within the margins I had set for the undertaking. Now, let's make this more interesting. If I launched the new product and lost 25% of my base clientele because they didn't like the product, that's a huge loss of 150K, a loss that can cripple a business. But, and this is the fun part, part for me, if with this new product I had tapped into the interest of a heretofore unknown group and that group totaled up to 250, 215,000 
and they delightedly bought my product, then with this new crop of clientele, I have offset the loss of my old client base and my actual gain over my starting point of 600,000 would be 10.83%. Not only would I have achieved the profit margin I determined beforehand that I could, despite the loss of 25% of the base I initially depended on for my business success, the growth of my clientele not only met, but exceeded my goals. I went from 600K to 665K. From there, I would then be poised to continue changing my business without having to cater to a segment of my base that isn't remotely interested in the changes I need to implement to ensure my business remains viable in a changing market. CBS continues to greenlight new seasons of Discovery, and it is about to launch Star Trek Picard. It has multiple episodes of short treks coming, as well as an animated show, actually two animated shows. They're planning to expand the Star Trek universe. Even if they lost a segment of the core fandom, their decisions make it clear that this loss has been offset by gains, and CBS All Access is growing well enough for them to position themselves for future financial success. Yes, one can claim that Star Trek doesn't have to be as costly to produce as it currently is, but one can be sure it doesn't need to be for it to appeal to the audience that CBS is betting on to grow the franchise and their online platform. I can't be sure of such a thing, and I would greatly be suspicious of the motivations of anyone who would. In my professional life, I've had to burst the bubbles of many creative types who stubbornly held to their beliefs of what their product should be, despite flagging sales demonstrating that the market no longer desires what they're selling, at least not in its original form. I can't tell you how many times I had to say tenderly but firmly, I get that you love this but there aren't enough people willing to buy it for me to allow it to dictate the direction of the business. You must do something to this baby to make it appeal to a wider audience, or I'm sorry, I will have to kill it, and you will need to start from scratch. One way or another, it is changing. The baby goes, or you both go. As a creative person myself, I understand the deep-seated urge to continue doing what one loves to do. But if there's any expectation that a viable business is to be based on that love, then one needs to see the writing on the wall and do what is required to save that love from total collapse. A shrewd and responsible CEO makes corrective changes before they are necessary, before the business is in a desperate state. In Star Trek's case, a desperate state would be when the gatekeepers have all died off and are no longer keeping the business barely afloat. They would have died content and taken the entire business into the grave with them. Are there other directions that CBS could have taken Star Trek in? Directions that both appeal to the base that's currently unhappy, as well as the new crop of fans that has gotten on board and still be very successful? Of course. This admittance doesn't negate the fact that the direction they did choose to go in is meeting with success. I hold that this iteration is growing the Trekkie fandom. Despite losing the percentage of the old guard fandom that a business has to be willing to burn off when taking a known IP in a different direction, even if the change is marginal and done to appeal to multiple generations of viewers, young people as well as older ones who hadn't bought into Star Trek during the previous heights of its popularity. If I were these showrunners in CBS, I would be crossing my fingers and toes in the hope that many of the viewers from this wellspring will be converted into Trekkies who will support these new iterations just as passionately as Trekkies have in the past. The old guard fandom are those who lament every little detail that doesn't align as they must, as they believe they must. Those whose exactitude was rewarded in the past with countless hours of intellectual and emotional pleasure when they dived deeply into the pools Roddenberry and the subsequent executive producers and showrunners of Star Trek shows filled for them, but who now thrash about in a panic as the pools are being expanded to allow an influx of creators and appreciators to pour in and join them. Instead of thrashing about, they can at any time decide to frolic. Star Trek Discovery is loved by the Trekkies who have always loved and appreciated Star Trek, even when they don't equally gel with every version of it, and it's left to be seen whether Star Trek Picard will be met with the same appreciation. Sadly, it comes as no surprise to me that the old guard's already zealously trying to sour this new pot. Some Trekkies come to dislike this new direction honestly. They don't care for the batch of showrunners because of what they know of them. 
the shows they've worked on in the past, the things they've said that they consider questionable, the business decisions they've made, they outright distrust them. They also don't care for this change in format. I can't fault any of them for this. Star Trek offered them specific things they enjoyed and those things have now changed, leaving them feeling marginalized. In this context, their dislike is appropriate and sane. Yet there's a subset of these marginalized Trekkies who dislike and how they go about expressing it feels eerily similar in nature to a person who's been dumped by someone they're still ardently in love with. They just can't let the relationship go. They stalk them and obsess over every little detail of that loved one's life, finding bizarre pleasure in the examination and skewering of the thing they still love, yet loathe for no longer loving them. When they bring their findings and complaints to their friends, the emotionally healthy friends implore, let go. The person is no longer for you. Just let go. That's met with a forceful, no, I love them and I just can't accept them walking away from me. I'm going to make them see the error of their ways and return to me. I'm going to make them see me again and value me. Usually at this point, they start losing their emotionally healthy friends, and the elephant in the room that's left unmentioned is that these particular friends have come to the realization that things have gone terribly wrong. They know that if they stick around, the likelihood is high that the next thing out of their inconsolable friend's mouth will be, I would rather see them dead than happy without me, instead of going down in that sad ship. These friends pull back and hope for the best while expecting any day now they'll hear all about just how bad things eventually ended. While I continue to ponder the why and the how, could they? I am growing to accept that this is just things how, how things are and probably how they've always been. People believe what they want to believe regardless of any evidence that categorically proves those beliefs to be false. Those who appear to be rational thinkers often behave irrationally it is human nature to plant a flag and then fight to the death to keep it where it is, even if what you're fighting against is a rising tide that will eventually drown you. Due to the nature of my mind, I will continue to ponder, but I'm also getting in an escape pod and jettisoning my, jettisoning, uh, jettisoning, jettisoning in my, how can I say that word? Jettisoning, jettisoning myself off the ship. We are always in a fight for the future, said Captain Pike in season two of Star Trek Discovery. And you know what? I would rather battle with those things that need to be defended instead of feigning fighting with phantoms or tackling things I would prefer to be different, but essentially aren't problems. As always, Rob, thank you for taking the time to read my letter. M.E. P.S. I don't expect this letter to be met with a positive reaction, but there are some... Uh, there's some dyes that simply must be thrown into the water and allowed to permeate the fabric within and of a space. Also, you may, but please don't feel you have to, share this letter with your audience. This is just me sharing my thoughts with someone I respect, even if we are very much in disagreement over what's currently happening with the Star Trek IP. Honestly, the situation periodically makes me laugh because it brings to my mind the blithe cockiness of the King George character from the play Hamilton. He had self-assuredly sang the following to the colonists right before they handed him a historical drubbing his nation would never recover from. I've not seen Hamilton, so I can't sing this, but I will say, you'll be back soon as you see. You'll remember you belong to me. You'll be back. Time will tell. You'll remember that I served you well. Oceans rise, empires fall. We have seen each other through it all. And when push comes to shove, I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. The irony is so sweet. Well, that's a long letter, but Emmy is one of my favorite people that I've never met. I feel, you know what I feel like? I feel like like every girl that ever broke up with me, I feel like I was in a relationship with Emmy and, and she and I, sh this is her way of breaking up with me. <laughs> I feel like this, this letter was directly, this is all about me. <laughs> and I can't, I can't help but take it personally. Great letter though. And I have to say that, um, all of her letters have been great, and she truly is a, a lovely human being, even though I've never met her. She looks lovely to me. But uh, this is a great letter, uh, well reasoned, very well thought out. I'm only gonna I'm 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 gonna allow you guys to think what you think. And this letter is posted on the Burnett Network. You can go to the Burnettwork.net and respond to it, or respond to it in the comments below. It's a great long letter, but here's what I my response. And, and to this beautifully written letter is I don't believe my whole thing about Star Trek Discovery is, and a lot of people love Star Trek Discovery. 
I don't think, I just don't think Star Trek Discovery is very good. I, I think from a, an empirical standpoint. <laughs> now, I know people like it. And I know it's really spoken to a lot of people. There's a lot of different kind of people who, who feel that Discovery has spoken to them. I think Discovery was a show that was compromised from the very beginning as evidenced by the departure of the first visionary showrunner. And it has been a bastardization of that original vision by people that never understood that original vision. So I think ultimately, um, and I'm not saying this about Star Trek Picard. I don't know about Star Trek Picard. I, I'm not going to judge a show, even though the same showrunner whose work has been bastardized in Star Trek Discovery came up with the original idea for Star Trek Picard. Now, the people that love Star Trek Discovery, I, I'm not here to tell them to not love things. I'm always like, you should love things. You should love things. But I believe personally that Star Trek Discovery, because of how expensive it is and because I don't think it's doing what, what Emmy says in this letter. I don't think it's building the brand the way Emmy is, is saying that it is. That remains to be seen. Uh, that will shake out. It might take three or four or five years before you can do a postmortem and say what's happening and where it's going. I think the way Star Trek is being handled as a brand has been, they have, they have violated my axiom, which is you don't put your universe before your characters. You have to make your stories and your characters lead the way. They will pull the universe behind you. And they are not doing that. They have two animated shows. They've got short treks. They've got Discovery and Picard all coming out. And none of them, well, the ones that only Discovery exists and short takes exist, have solidified their success enough to where I feel that it's warranted to make two animated shows. I think the whole, the idea, even though I've got friends working on a Nickelodeon show, I think that the whole idea that you're going to make a Star Trek show that appeals to children is a mistake. I think it's a mistake. Because what you're doing then is you're going to try and change the Star Trek concept into a child-friendly one. And I believe, because I was one of these kids, that Star Trek already appealed to children because for whatever, whatever X factor there is, certainly appealed to me as a five-year-old. I don't know if making a kid-friendly Star Trek is actually helping or ultimately hurting your brand. I don't know. I mean, we're into, we're into, we're into new waters. And I, I'm, I, I'd be happy to eat my words. I want Picard to be great. I really do. I want the Picard series to stand up as a great a continuation the same way I love Creed. I've talked about this many times on the show. I love Creed. I think in terms of extending a universe, what Ryan Coogler did as a lover of the Rocky franchise, he loved the Rocky franchise. Creed is a perfect example of somebody who truly loved that franchise and created something new and yet respectful of the original franchise, the original movies, added to the universe, added to that franchise by telling the story of more great characters and giving them a great story to inhabit. That's what I want for Star Trek. That's what I want for Picard. Now, I'm perfectly willing to eat my words. I mean, I want to see Star Trek succeed. I, I, I think, as I've said before, I think Star Trek Discovery is a total, in the long term, a bastardization. Worse, you know, I just think Star Trek Discovery is, is especially as an example, I can't go, the, the portrayal of a rogue AI in the second half of Discovery Season 2, to me was was it was the most dumbed down version of that story it was 50 it felt like it was this antiquated that i was watching something that was made 50 years ago and and 50 years ago it, even then it would have been smarter you know we saw we saw stories about even i mud with the androids the android society in i mud there was far more nuanced and subtle, yes, subtle, subtle storytelling going on in that episode of the original series than anything in the latter half. Season two of Star Trek Discovery, everything about it, the science, the time traveling, all, I just, I wanted to punch my screen. I was like, this feels like it, it has been written by people that have never read science fiction. They don't understand the genre and they're picking and choosing from things they might have seen once or twice 40 years ago. And, and I think... You know, it's. I don't think people are rejecting Star Trek Discovery because they want things to be the way they used to be. I don't think that's the case at all. 
I think the people that have rejected Star Trek Discovery want it to be great. I know I want it to be great. God damn, the amount of money they're spending. Why isn't it great? It should be great. It's not great. But I know that Emmy loves it, and I have great respect for Emmy. I, I think we could probably be great friends and sit across from one, one another, and I wouldn't. she wouldn't want to wring my neck. At least I would hope she wouldn't want to. But um, maybe she would. You know, you never know. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. Um, wow, this is by far, this 200th episode has become the longest episode of Rob's Observations. It is now three hours and 10 minutes long. Uh, Gary Ritchie says, happy 200th, Rob. I'm looking forward to the next 200. Well, Gary Ritchie, thank you for that. You know, it's funny, my desire today was to try and get through all of the letters um, that uh, that I uh, that I have here. And I have so many more that I haven't got through. <laughs> so many more. But I just, I can't, it's not fair to anybody else. Like, as much as I, I was going to stay on, I can't, I can't go on anymore. I can't do it anymore. Um, well, maybe I can, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> Let's see. Um, this one's actually pretty interesting. I like this. You know what? This is appropriate. This is appropriate for the 300 show. Hour number three, ladies and gentlemen, we're into hour number three of Rob's Observations. And this one comes from Martin Lawrence. And this is actually, I really like this letter because it's about an imagination connoisseur's journey. And it's a good letter. It's a good one. Greetings and salutations, Rob. I've been wanting to send this ever since hearing Willow Yang's heartfelt letter a few observations ago. I want to share my experience of social anxiety and how it was conquered by a chance encounter with a burger van owner. I was an extra extroverted kid at first school. I was always able to make friends, always joking and making people laugh. That changed in high school, where I was bullied extensively throughout my time there. By the time I made my way to college, I was a changed man, quiet, quiet withdrawn and unable to converse with the opposite sex. I felt alone and cast adrift from society. All I had were my DVDs and books, which was a place to escape. And that was where I went on the adventures of Chuck Norris and Captain Kirk. By chance, I stopped to buy a burger from a van parked across from where I was working. We got to talking, well, him mostly, and he said he was a martial arts instructor looking to set up a class locally. I initial, initially didn't believe it, thinking it was bravado, but I saw a leaflet a few weeks later with the venue and start time. Why I went along, I have no idea. Maybe curiosity, I don't know. And yet, after the weeks went by and I saw people come and go, I was the one constant. I never thought that I would get a black belt. It was joyous. I felt like I had self-worth. The old me was starting to emerge. I was invited to a party after my second black belt where I met my now girlfriend of 14 years. Wow, you've got a girlfriend of 14 years? Not marriage? She loves Marvel. That's my old, that's, you know, that's me being provincial. I'm just happy you have a girlfriend for 14 years. Congratulations. Give her, a, give her a hug for me. She loves Marvel and DC movies, although not nearly as much as me. She had no idea who Wolf Spain is or Booster Gold. She thinks that Vinnie Jones is the definitive version of the juggernaut. <laughs> so you can't have everything. So to end this, I say to you, Willow, you most certainly have self-worth, and I guarantee there is someone out there who will love you for who you are. I am proud to be a member of this, the post-geek singularity. Yours sincerely, Martin Lawrence. I love this letter. Um, you know what I love about this letter? It's it, it sort of, you know, Martin, like he says, he 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 went to this black belt class. It was a, a chance meeting. He saw this guy weeks later. He saw his flyer. He went to this class and it changed his life. And it's not exactly what I say, but at the end of every episode, what do I sign off with? Every person you meet has a story to tell you haven't heard. This guy told Martin a story. He told Martin a story. And what did Martin do? Martin listened. He listened to that story. And if he didn't listen to the story, he wouldn't have taken notice when he saw the flyer weeks later. And look what happened. He's got, what, two black belts, double black belt now, changed his life. He's had a girlfriend of 14 years. Okay, if he she thinks Vinnie Jones is the definitive juggernaut, who are you to say no? Maybe he is. At least to her, he is. Does that make her wrong? 
Well, Martin, this is a great letter. I love this letter. It's a perfect letter to read on uh, this, the 200th epi episode of this show. And um, I think it was great. Um, so thank you. And you know what? That makes me want to read another, another letter. I'm going to read another letter because why not? I like this letter too. This letter is from Real Girl 26. Real Girl 26. Uh, and this is a great letter, but I love this letter too. Rob, I find I've reached a place where I truly want to enjoy films. Yes, there are always going to be those I view that I won't necessarily like or enjoy, but I attempt to go into every film I'm about to see with the hope of doing so. This mindset is something I've been slowly, or so it seems, building on and has brought more happiness into my life. This has also led me to being more open to watch films I otherwise wouldn't have. A couple of examples of such films are a little low-budget film called Repo, a Genetic Opera. I really did not enjoy that film, but usually I'm very turned off by anything musical anyways, so I wasn't surprised by that. However, it was recommended to me, and I gave it a shot. By the way, I hope my friend Spooky Dan is not watching this show. There's a whole cult around uh, Repo, the genetic opera. I actually like the film, but it's interesting. I understand why people don't. I'm just saying I'm glad you watched it. I like that you took a shot. I also gave a much bigger and well-loved musical, The Greatest Showman, a shot. I actually enjoyed that one, much to my surprise. No, it isn't something I'm going to buy, but I will definitely watch it again if I get the chance. Something else this newish mindset has done is given me more enjoyment of films I'm gr I've grown up with and films from the O's, the aughts, to before 2018 that I've seen many times over. With how things have been with the loud minority lately taking up space in recent months, or maybe it's years by now, I wanted to share something a bit different than that. Yes, I've heard some great letters here. It's always awesome to hear them. Let's keep them coming, guys. And thank you, Rob, for leading these conversations. Real Girl 26. Well, Real Girl 26, thank you for that. But I think, you know, you have hit on something that I've jokingly said to people over the years. People are always saying to me, you know, they're like, why do you, you, you know, you're always so happy and you're always bouncing off the walls and you get excited for things and how come you know you're excited for Bond 25 even though half the James Bond movie you see disappoint you and all that stuff? To me, it's a choice. It's literally a choice. Um, you can choose to go into things wanting them to be good or seeing that there's good in them, or you can choose to think things suck. Now, I know how hard movies are to make. And I, I really do go into every movie I see and I sit down and I want to love it. You know, you have to, a movie has to, or a TV show has to make me not love it. Because I go in, every time I, I get excited about every movie that I see. I really do. And when a movie doesn't, when I don't love it, it bums me out. Not only because uh, the movie itself, the story, whatever reason. But I know how many people work really hard. Everybody, I don't care what anybody says. Everybody working on movies is trying to make them good. Same with TV. You know, the people that are making Star Trek Discovery, they're trying to make the best show that they can make. Truly, they are. It's just they're not people that particularly love Star Trek. You know, they're people that like working in television and things like that, but the passionate people behind Star Trek. But for the most part, they are still trying to make the best show they can make, as most people do, because it's too damn hard. And I think, you know, even when I don't like Star Trek Discovery, I still watch every episode and I'm like, this. I hope this episode's really good. I really honestly think that. And I, I talk about uh, things and sometimes I'll, I'll be upset about the upcoming Picard show and, you know, just from my own mind, I'm working through issues. But I, I do want it to be great. I really, who doesn't want a Star Trek Picard show to be not great? I don't know anybody that does. Everybody wants it to be great. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's a television show, at least a genre show, that has been made that people are more excited about than Star Trek Picard. I mean, everybody loves Patrick Stewart. Who doesn't love Patrick Stewart? Who doesn't love Jean-Luc Picard? Everybody loves Jean-Luc. My mom loves Jean-Luc Picard. Everybody does. Nobody wants a Picard show to be bad. So, you know, but it's a choice. Real Girl points out, look what she did. 
She made a change in her life. She's like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into things wanting to like him. Look, Repo the Genetic Opera is not exactly the easiest movie in the world to like. It's not. By the way, if I might recommend a another what I think is the best horror music, the the great Polish horror musical about mermaids, The Lure. I recommend this all the time. It's on it's on Blu-ray. Criterion put it out. Watch The Lure. If you didn't like Repo, the genetic opera, allow me to tell you to watch the greatest Polish horror musical about mermaids, The Lure. Just go watch the, watch the trailer on YouTube. And if the trailer doesn't sell you, I don't know what will. Watch The Lure. Because I'm telling you, can't go wrong. This is the, I, I give, Rob observations gives The Lure its highest recommendation. So if you're into that, check it out. Check it out. Uh, Emmy, Emmy is here. <laughs> Thank you, Emmy. And thanks for that lovely letter. How could I break up with someone who puts his audience through my letter? <laughs> I don't think we put it. It was a great letter. I appreciate your mind, even if I have to tune out when you begin discussing Star Trek. <laughs> by the by, happy 200th. Well, Emmy, thank you. You've certainly enriched my life. And uh, that was a great letter. And I'll be curious to see what people have to say about it. Um, Kartik Prasad says, thank you for the extended talk. Well, Kartik, thank you. Thanks for supporting the channel. I appreciate it. Um, actually, you know what? I'm here. There's more letters. There's more letters. This is actually a good letter, too. And this letter comes from Troy. Uh, Troy Williams is uh, from cinemasurvey.net. Troy, Troy has written a number of times. He's an old school, as far as an eight-month show can have old school members. <laughs> Troy has been here for a while. Troy says, hey, Rob. Ever since I saw the this is a great letter. I love this letter. <laughs> Ever since I saw the holodeck in Star Trek, I have been fascinated by the idea of such an invention. You can create any scenario, bring up any location, and basically do anything you can imagine, all in a computer simulation. You want to ride a horse in an open field? Go ahead. Do you want to visit the top of the Eiffel Tower? Feel free. Do you want to fight in glorious battles with a bunch of Klingons at your side? Kapla. The appeal of a potential holodeck is obvious. You are free to go and do anything you want. Not only is it good for enjoyment, however, it is also good for practicing different medical or military scenarios without risk of death or injury. That said, there is also a lot of danger that comes with the holodeck. People could get sucked into the appeal of the holodeck and spend their free time only in a fantasy like Barkley did in TNG. Or Bordas did in the Orville. There could also be artificial relationships created, like the time Jordy LaForge attempted to have a romantic relationship with Leah Brahms, the version he created of her in the holodeck. This doesn't sound very healthy to me, and I think this would be a real problem if holodecks were a reality. While I don't know if we will ever have holodecks as detailed and limitless as those in Star Trek, I do absolutely believe we will have holodecks one day. We've already started to see many versions of holodecks with virtual reality technology, as this holodeck type technology grows, so will the problem of people growing more and more lost in VR and, the, and distant from the real world. Do you see this as something that could potentially be a problem? I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Thanks, Rob. Troy, cinemasurvey.net. Well, a great letter. I mean, we all want holodeck technology. I think VR technology is amazing, and we're going to get there. Now, at first... As the eternal optimist I am, I think this kind of technology could be extremely beneficial. Like you already pointed out, the educational benefits, the travel benefits. Look, especially for people that are are uh, at all. The whole Captain Pike idea in the cage after he was horribly disfigured in that accident, Delta rays uh, forever dooming him to be in a wheelchair. If if you could live in a virtual world for the rest of your life, I think it would be far more. Because, I mean, if you think about it, what is our perception of reality? Reality is only what our senses tell us what it is. But if you could somehow inner, uh, you know, uh, um, make our, change the electrical impulses that our senses are sending us, smell, taste, sound, sight, and you could punch in or, or program in whatever you wanted people to see, virtual environments. So, the holodeck, or maybe like in brainstorm, you can put on a machine and it immediately it just feeds you the sensory information. You don't even need the holodeck. But if we get to that technology, 
on one hand, I think it can be mostly beneficial, but I can see it immediately uh, perverted. <laughs> As Rick Berman pointed out, and he was right, Rick Berman said in our interviews when we were working on the Star Trek the Blue, uh, Next Generation Blu-rays, he said that the two things he credited for blowing up the internet was Star Trek and porn. <laughs> because when the internet became a thing, those are the two things that exploded. Chat boards where people were discussing Star Trek because early adopters, and then, of course, people sharing pornography. And I'm sure the deepest, darkest impulses of mankind could uh, definitely be something that they were going to be delving into right away, right away. Um, so uh, here's the thing. Like anything, it would have to be managed. Uh, I think it could be a great therapy tool. There's many different things a holodeck could be used for. But, you know, human beings are, we are uh, creatures of flesh and blood. We are subject to getting our dopamine fixes and 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 human beings are, are predictable and, and all of that. Uh, I, I think there's both good and bad that's going to come with this kind of technology. But I think one of the, one of the things that has fascinated me is again, the Ian Malcolm school, just because you could do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. And that's what we always have to ask ourselves is technological innovations, especially now, are coming down the pike faster than our ability to deal with them ethically, morally, culturally. And I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem. And as soon as this kind of technology, I mean, look, what is the first thing, techno, the porn industry, sex, the sex industry is, is one of the first things that drive modern technology. It always has been that way. And the real question is, well, why? Why? And, uh, you know, people's rich fantasy lives, I think, are, are, are uh, that's always going to drive technology. And, and I agree with you. Look, my rich fantasy world, if I could live in a Star Trek universe for like six months, I would. I, I, you know, it'd be fun. We all love role-playing games. We all love, I mean, the real question is, and we've seen examinations of this. They've done it both on the Orville and on Star Trek The Next Generation. have done it, done it very well. I mean, what's it like? Uh, one of the great examples, I think, of virtual worlds is The Matrix. You know, there's that great scene where Joey Pants sells out the crew of the Nebuchadnezzar and, and, um, He's like, look, I just want to go into my virtual world. It just doesn't matter from where I'm standing, from my perception. When you put me back in the matrix, I'm not going to know I'm in the matrix. You know, when I'm eating a steak, it's going to taste like a steak. The real world sucks. I hate this. I'm, I'm a warrior. I'm eating this disgusting slop every day. I'd rather live in a world where even though it's virtual, it'll, it's better. And, and what is perception? I mean, we get into those, those philosophical questions. What is real? What isn't real? Um, but again, it's going to take, it, we need a cultural evolution and it's going to be a question. These are questions that are going to arise. And, you know, that's another thing is, is I feel one of the things that's like bumming me out is I feel like however much time I have left on this planet, I feel like I'm never going to be the great, the great, if there's a great tragedy in my own life, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's that not, have I had the motion picture success I wanted? No, but, but I'm still working in that direction. And I don't, I got to do it. You know, I, I've had a lot of fun. I've worked on a lot of great projects, but I think the great, the great sadness of my life is I'm never going to be able to travel in space. I'm never going to be able to go like Haywood Floyd to a moon base. I'm never going to have lived through like a first contact. We, we just haven't progressed very far technologically um, or, or culturally. I, I thought we would be further along. And, and I don't know, we seem to be regressing. The world is, I just happened to be living through a period of time where I got to watch all of this technology come. And now we're going to watch whether it's climate change or whether it's economics or, and what, what's missing, what I think is missing. And I don't know how to get this. And I go back to Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens, when he asks at the end, when he goes through human history, is that right now we're living through a period of time where Humanity has no collective, what, what we need to replace, what we most need as a planet of people, but we're never going to get there because we're not all equal as far as economics are concerned. And, and, and it's going to get a lot more unequal with climate change, but we need to know what we, what do we want as a race? And I mean the human race, what do we want? What are we going to do? We need a direction right now. We are like a rudderless ship. And, and right now, the, the people calling the shots, whether you want to call it the, the elite, the 
there's all this income inequality. They don't have a direction. They don't have a grand design. Their grand design is for the next fiscal quarter and money and all that. But they don't have a grand design for us as a as a race. You know, and the really the only place we're either going to go to the, the where we should go transhumanism transcending our lifespans and and finding sub ways to substantially increase our lifespans because once our lifespans are substantially increased i believe we would look at each other differently we would look at our own lives differently but until there's a substantial increase in lifespan or technology increases where we can download our consciousness into the whatever it is i don't know what it is but but those are the things that are going to have to fundamental changes in the human experience are going to have to continue and if you think about it lifespans have almost doubled since 100, 120 years ago. We're doing okay, but I feel right now we've reached this stagnant point and I, we're going to fall back into our own ways because we don't have a direction. That's what we need. And I think, you know, holodeck technology and, and medical technology and all this technology that we have, like we are living in a, in a time where we are accepting all kinds of, of things that are happening in our biosphere, whether it's extinction of animals, whether it's pollution, it, it, it's it's amazing to me. I'm like, what do what do we as a race of people, as the human race, what do we think is going to happen to our biosphere? It's not just climate change; it's pollution, it's clear cutting forests. You know, what's going to happen? We're cutting our own throats. I feel we really are the the frog in the pot, and we don't have. We need a collective dream, and I do think if we had holodeck technology, people would would descend into that. Hey, if you could go into the world of Warcraft virtual world, or I could go to the Star Trek or Star Wars virtual world, whatever, you know, people would rather do that than, than solve our problems. But I would like to see the human race. I recently read an article about, about climate change. It was very depressing. I believe it was from a Harvard scientist, very well regarded, who basically said, look, it's too late. You know, unless we have a World War II style Manhattan project on a global scale with everybody involved, we're going to live through a world of hurt and we are, and we're going to see that. And, um, you know, I just wish that we collectively would ask ourselves, and I don't know how to do this with our internecine squabbles and hatred of one another. I, I don't see us getting together. I don't, unless we're going to have an extinction event asteroid hit us. I don't know. But what I would like to see, that's my dream with holographic technology and all of the, the great communication systems that we have, we as human beings, as a race of one kind of people as human beings despite our color differences our gender differences our belief differences we all are human beings all of us i wish we would ask ourselves what we want because we do have the power to figure it out and um we need to as as tom hardy said in in uh, inception you have to dream bigger darling and i think we do i think we do um, let's see. You know what? That's it. That's, I've got to bring this chat to an end. My moderators, if, I don't even know if they're still here. Are people still here? Are the moderators still here? Did they all leave? Is it a free for all? I don't even know. <laughs> um, maybe it is. Anyway, I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to bring this chat to a close. Rob observations. This has been a three and a half hour marathon conversation. This is longer than Godfather two. And, uh, it's longer than Return of the King, I believe. This was longer than Return of the King. Anyway, I want to say what a great show. What, thank you all for this outpouring of support for the channel. Thank you for all of these letters. Keep them coming. There's more coming across the transom all the time. If you like these chats, please hit like. Please continue to be a part uh, of, of this. I think we are building a good thing here. If you want to share these things, tell people to, to subscribe to the channel, to like the channel. It helps those YouTube analytics. Um, Thank you all very, very much. I very much appreciate it. And I want to give a shout out. One of my favorite people in the world is my friend Mary Forrest's dad. Her dad, Sam Forrest. I don't know if you, anyone watching this knows Mary Forrest, but uh, I adore Mary Forrest. I've adored her for a very long time. But one of the great people in the world is her father, Sam. You will never meet a nicer, kinder, more God-fearing man than Sam Forrest. It is his 90th birthday today. I want to give a shout out to Sam Forrest because he is certainly the best of us. And happy birthday to Sam and may long may he wave. 
But I want to say thank you to everybody who's participated in these chats and made this channel what it is. I also want to th thank Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great for sponsoring the channel and continuing to sponsor the channel. And go to Lucky uh, GetLuckyTiger.com. If you buy stuff, you can use PGS for Post Geek Singularity. Get 20% off, as you know. And they are running their Tailgaters giveaway for the upcoming football season. $500 plus worth of tailgating stuff. So you can tailgate like a boss, including an entire grill. You can put a grill in your car. And they're doing that through Labor Day. So if you go to GetLuckyTiger.com or ClubLuckyTiger.com, you can join that giveaway. I can't because they sponsor me, but I wouldn't mind getting $500 worth of tailgating stuff. But I want to thank all of you. It means such a great deal to have this kind of community, and we're building it, and it keeps building, and it's so awesome. Everybody's been so great. This has been a great chat. Thanks for, for being here, and, uh, you know, it's it's – it's pretty great. You know, it's it's a pretty great thing. I've, I've been touched by many of your words today. And thanks for everybody that, that has, has said so many nice things. And it really means a lot. And I will bring this chat. Rob Observations, the show about something. Live chat number 200. My God. I guess if I had a, a heart attack tonight and you never saw me again, this would be a good way to go out. But I hope I'll be back tomorrow. I've got so much work to do. I want to see Tango Shalom finished. I want to be able to put Free Enterprise in 4K and make my own final cut of that. But I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart, really. And I have to say, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And I think with that, I can say, as I always do, oh, wait, Suthius. <laughs> Suthi says, Suthi sends in, hey, Mr. B, putting my boy to sleep, so I thought I'd stop by and say, yo, son, before probably falling asleep myself. Catch you tomorrow on the show. All right, Suthius, thank you very much. Well, as always, by the way, I'm going I'm to pimp Her Universe. This is a Her Universe shirt. I don't know if they make them. I am not in Gilbert. Are you going to say goodbye? You want to come up here? Come here. Want to come up? I'll give you a cookie. Want to say goodbye, Gilly? Come here, dude. Come here. Come on up. Say goodbye to everybody. You started the show. Oh, look, Tallulah. Come on. Come on. Come up. There you go. So I'm just going to say goodbye. You get to Cookie. It's the end show. Your Tallulah's here, too. Because it's, it's kind of fitting. It's kind of fitting, right? This giant Muppet dog. Oh, one of you just farted. Thanks for that. I guess that's good, I suppose. All right. Hey, hey, you know, you only, you only get so many. You only get three at a time, bud. Three at a time. There's one for Tallulah. Okay, Gilbert. Gonna have one more. Say goodbye to everyone. Oh, this guy. I love these guys. They're so good, right, buddy? You're so good, aren't you? Yeah. And you too, Talula. Now, Gilbert, you gotta get down. No, you have to get down. You're gonna pull my microphone. You gotta get down, bud. You gotta get down, buddy. Yes. And you too, Talula. You wanna come up? You can come up. You never come up. Oh, there she is. There's Talula, everybody. There's Talula. She is an Irish doodle. She's damn cute. Her nickname is Squeaker because whenever she yawns, she squeaks. Don't you? You should do. Give me a kiss, baby. Yes, give me a kiss. Yeah, I know. No, not too many kisses. All right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, these dogs are great, aren't they? You're great, aren't you? Yeah, they're great. Well, everyone, again, I'm going to say goodbye. I will say goodbye to everybody. Uh, thanks again. What a great show this has been. I will always say this. As always, everyone, have a better day. <laughs>